fractions uh, via extreme non-occurrity polarisms. Please on. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it's uh, it's very nice to attend uh, this uh, virtual meeting, and I have been learning a lot um, of cool things the last uh, two days. So today, um, I will present um, our recent work on ultra strong um, coupling, light matter coupling, in two types of uh, cavity structures shown here. So let me um, start by um, thanking the conference organizers for the, uh, this invitation and also my collaborators. So our work includes uh, both the theory and experimental parts. Um, the, the theoretical work part was done by Luis and Fernando and also my colleague in Minnesota, Tony Lowe. For experiments, uh, we have um, many collaborators around the world um, for synthesis of uh, 2D materials and uh, all the measurements and uh, analysis. So um, there are many um, experts in quantum physics in the audience, uh, but just for completeness, uh, let's, let me start with a, an overview of light matter coupling regimes um, based on uh, many of these excellent uh, review articles. So most of the spectroscopy works from my group, previous work, um, like a surface enhanced um, scattering, surface enhanced uh, absorption per cell effect. They were um, in the weak coupling regime where um, the splitting um, or coupling strength G is um, smaller than the system losses. So we treat uh, light matter interaction as uh, perturbation. And past few days, uh, we've seen many examples of strong coupling where um, the coupling strength exceeds losses in the system. Now, on the other hand, when we talk about ultra strong coupling, we um, do not compare uh, coupling strength to system losses, but um, to the transition frequency or bare, or bare transition frequency of the system. So typically when the coupling strength is uh, about 10% or larger than the transition frequency of the system, it's called the uh, ultra strong coupling regime. And one um, signature or example of ultra strong coupling is uh, the presence of um, a stop band or this uh, rest stolen band uh, between upper polaritone and lower polaritone branch. And um, that's well known in the case of uh, Burke phonon polaritons in polar materials. And um, the light matter coupling in this case is very strong, so strong that uh, so light cannot, uh, is uh, reflected uh, and cannot penetrate. So the goal of our, one of our experiments was to insert such uh, materials into resonant nano cavity and uh, see uh, what happens. And if the coupling strength uh, further increases, then we reach a deep strong coupling regime. And um, so many uh, interesting applications emerged from the study of weak and strong coupling regimes. So we expect uh, new and exciting applications in these uh, new regimes. And um, let's see, uh, as we saw in many previous talks, um, uh, a key ingredient to study strong coupling physics. It's a, a resonant cavity. So fabry perot cavity is widely used. And also there's a nice uh, recent work by Reiner's group, uh, which uses a um, micro cavity to study uh, ultra strong vibration coupling in boron nitride. And then we've seen pico cavity and uh, adjustable uh, peak based um, nano cavity uh, yesterday. Also in the circuit QED community, this uh, transmission line cavity is, uh, is used. And as in this example, uh, a coaxial cable uh, acting as a cavity. So in our group, uh, we, we have been developing um, sort of a nanophotonic version of such coaxial cables or uh, optical nano coax. And it's a, a gap size is um, small, uh, less than 10 nanometers or even one or two nanometers in width. It can transmit light resonantly and uh, so it sort of combines the key features of 
nanophotonic cavities and um, transmission line cavity. And so this slide summarizes a, a sort of works by other groups on nanocoax. And not surprisingly, many, many groups have uh, studied uh, theories and found experimental methods to realize this nanocoax structures. And so in the first part of my talk, I will talk about um, ultra strong coupling in this uh, vertical nanocoaxial cavity. And then I will talk about a different type of cavity, a planar cavity made with uh, graphene and an ultra flat matter where we insert uh, materials in between. So about coax, um, let's, so let's look at the resonance um, resonance system in this optical nano coax structures. As we know from the ENM course, um, the coaxial uh, cable has a fundamental TEM mode, which does not have cutoff. But um, in experiments, we typically excite these structures with linearly polarized light. So um, when we do that at normal incidence due to symmetry, we cannot excite this TEM mode. Instead, uh, this uh, TE11 uh, mode um, can couple to linearly polarized light. And if you look at the, the cross section along the film thickness direction, the coax, like uh, other fabric peril cavity, can uh, sustain fabric peril resonances. And um, Fadi Baida's group and uh, other groups um, have nicely summarized, uh, studied and summarized the uh, resonances of coax. And it's, uh, let me use their uh, figures. In this case, each panel shows uh, two side-by-side -side coax structures uh, cross section. And one interesting aspect of this, uh, this structure is that near the um, cutoff frequency, there is a, a zero order fabric parallel resonance. And then we have a first order, a second order, a typical fabric parallel resonance along this film thickness direction. Now, when you look at the uh, zero order resonance, it has um, a uniform field and a constant phase along this uh, vertical axis. So it's efficient for uh, light matter coupling experiments when we have uh, materials in the, this uh, cavity. Also, um, this mode is um, insensitive to the incidence angle of light. As we change the incidence angle, um, the resonance uh, frequency uh, remains the same. So compared um, with a planar fabric pearl cavity, so, this is a, a nice feature since uh, the coaxial cavity can be more uh, robust against misalignment and also when you use a focused uh, beam illumination. So the focus of my group um, has been to make these uh, coaxial apertures with very small gaps down to a few nanometers. And we cannot make such structures um, using um, conventional E-beam lithography or focused ion beam lithography with high throughput. But instead, our approach is based on atomic layer deposition. So these days, when we make uh, these nano coax structures for uh, mid IR and terahertz applications, we don't have to use electron beam lithography. Um, instead, we start with a uh, um, photolithography uh, using a stepper and that's much cheaper and much faster and works on a, a four inch wafer. So in our process, we first define a pattern a disk array using gold or other metals. And for mid IR, it's typically a one micron diameter uh, structure. And uh, the key step is uh, using atomic layer deposition, we can formally coat metal oxide film on the sidewall and the top surface of this uh, disk structure. So in most cases, uh, we use uh, uh, aluminum oxide, which is the, the most common ALD uh, film. For phonon polariton studies, uh, we use the SiO2 silica. And there are many other interesting materials options, like a deposit uh, titanium oxide, zinc oxide, or um, 
hafnia based uh, ferroelectric films. So we have uh, many interesting options. Now um, we spot our, another layer of gold film. So we have this uh, mushroom-like structure on top. And then um, using a uh, glancing angle ion milling, we shave off the top surface eventually, and then expose this uh, coaxial cavity filled with aluminum oxide. And we run this process over a, a four inch wafer. And um, one of the, the advantage of using the zero mode, zero order resonance is fairly insensitive to the film thickness. So in this process, we don't have to precisely control the film thickness. And um, for uh, mid IR and terahertz spectroscopy, uh, typically we use a large illumination spot size. And having this a large area substrate is very important because we can get a uh, good signal to noise ratios. Okay, so experimentally, uh, the zero order fabric pearl resonance, um, this is measured from FTIR using um, gold coax filled with aluminum oxide. You can see uh, resonance peak for each uh, gap size from 10 nanometer width all the way down to nominal one nanometer gap size. It's very clearly visible. The absolute transmittance is uh, very high and um, this, uh, the diameter in this case is a uh, 250 nanometers and periodicity is a uh, half a micron. Okay. So to understand um, the origin of this uh, strong, well-defined resonance, um, we show a simulation um, of similar uh, devices with similar parameter. Uh, what this shows is a uh, calculated uh, propagation constant along the, the coaxial film thickness direction. So as you see here, um, around wavelength of three micron, the rear part of propagation constant uh, approaches zero that corresponds to the cutoff condition. And that's where we see this uh, intense resonance. So it's a cutoff resonance or zero order resonance. And as we reduce the gap size, the resonance shifts to longer wavelength. And um, an alternative way to understand that this effect um, is this a nice epsilon near zero framework. You know, if a waveguide is at um, cutoff condition, it becomes an effective uh, ENZ medium. Then all the um, predictions, uh, features of ENZ phenomena kick in. And we know this includes wavelength stretching. So along this uh, coaxial uh, gap direction, Wavelength is very large. That also means uh, phase is nearly constant as we saw from the zero order mode. And it means a uh, transmission through narrow channels. So in coax channel as narrow as one or two nanometers can pass light with high efficiency. We haven't um, uh, experimentally observed the super radiance and nonlinear effects, but that's the, on our to-do list. And um, one thing to note is that um, these resonances are the characteristic of a single coaxial aperture. We chose the small array periodicity, in this case, uh, half a micron. So there is um, the grading coupling, like those are periodic effect, but they occur at shorter wavelength. So we can separate out the ENZ resonance with other uh, more complex uh, periodic effects. So for applications, um, the first thing uh, we did was to fill um, the gap of this coax with protein molecules and uh, measure enhanced absorption due to this uh, ENZ resonance. Now the challenge was um, the way we make this uh, coax, it's filled with aluminum oxide after fabrication. So that means to backfill with molecules, we had to etch aluminum film. So we typically use a uh, hot phosphoric acid. And then we insert protein. For this experiment, we used the uh, um, spin-coded uh, silk protein as a model system. It's a very thin layer was coated on top. Um, it's not easy to completely fill. Uh, our estimation is only about 15% of this uh, gap length is filled with protein molecules. But nevertheless, when we shine infrared light, 
the light must pass through this uh, narrow gap, which is also filled with protein molecules. So we can um, boost absorption quite significantly. Uh, we estimate uh, about 10,000 times uh, enhanced absorption. And we can clearly see um, in transmission spectrum, the resonance of a coax. Now we see two strong absorption beeps caused by MID1 and MID2 bands of uh, protein molecules. So the absorption is enhanced, but we are still in the weak coupling regime. The resonance is unchanged as uh, we see perturbation caused by proteins. And um, since vibrational strong coupling uh, in the mid IR range has been um, studied by many groups, we were also interested in using our coaxial uh, resonator cavity to study this topic. So um, our next step was to see, instead of uh, filling um, the gap with protein molecules partially, how can we push this light matter interaction into ultra strong coupling regime? So we chose, uh, we did two things. We chose a SiO2 film to couple light with their um, vibrational polar phonons. And um, in this case, during fabrication, we can completely fill the cavity with SiO2 film. That way uh, we can, we could make a transition from weak coupling to ultra strong coupling regime. So it's based on our recent paper in collaboration with Luis, um, Josh Caldwell, and Marcus Roschke, and Matt Pelton. Um, group. Let me um, show the fabrication process just once more. Start with a uh, four inch silicon wafer, undoped silicon wafer, which is a transparent in the mid IR. And we deposit uh, SiO2 film conformally using ALD. Here, this is our active material under study. So um, we do not have to etch it later. So after glancing and lyo milling and shaving off the top surface, uh, our structure is finished and the cavity is completely filled with um, SiO2 film. Uh, so this is a, a photograph of the full wafer after processing. And when you, when you look at the dimensions here, the advantage of this uh, uh, ENZ coax cavity becomes obvious. Um, the film is very thin. Um, the final gold film thickness is about 80 nanometers. Um, but the free space wavelength we use to study uh, vibration coupling is about 10 microns. Okay, and the diameter of coax is uh, around one micron with varied to tune resonances. Now, if we use a conventional diffractive um, cavity, then the thickness also scales with the wavelength. So typically you need a, a micro cavity if you go to terahertz, perhaps you need even thicker cavity. For a zero order ENZ resonance, um, it's independent of the film thickness. So we can use a very thin metal film to form a resonant cavity and only 80 nanometers in this case, regardless of whether we use a mid IR, far IR or uh, even terahertz waves. And again, the, the resonance of coax is determined by the geometry of a single cavity, not the periodicity. The periodic effect is uh, at a shorter wavelength and separated out. The gap size we used was 2, 7, 14, and 21 nanometer. It's very precisely controlled by the cycle number of ALD. So uh, we have a very good control. Now here is the dielectric permittivity of SiO2 film. Uh, so rear part of epsilon becomes negative in the rest strolling band from um, 1050 to 1230 inverse centimeter. Now here is the, um, the simulated resonance of uh, uncoupled the bare coax without SiO2, um, just to, to see the design parameters. Now, as we increase the diameter, then the resonance uh, scales, resonance wavelength scales accordingly to lower frequency. 
And at some point, the resonance of coax couples with um, the rest of Strahlen band. Now, experimentally, uh, this shows uh, FTIR measurements from a uh, seven nanometer gap coax. We made a, a large array with different uh, dimensions. And uh, so this is, um, as diameter becomes larger, then we see uh, emergence of two peaks here. And this is collection of experimental spectra from 21 nanometer um, gap coax. Okay. And so we measure this uh, um, signature of uh, emergence of two peaks and uh, anti-crossing. Uh, and then uh, in parallel, so Luis and Fernando uh, developed uh, a theory by deriving the, the governing equations based on uh, coupled harmonic oscillators in our cavity system. This is the, the matrix, which um, is actually the same as the, the matrix describing bulk phonon polaritons. And then the, this is the summary of all of our measurements uh, for different gap sizes. So the polariton branches um, we obtained from the classical oscillator model, they agree, they agree well with um, experimental results shown here. So you can see uh, clear anti-crossing behavior as we change the diameter and resonance of the coax. And we measure this uh, splitting, uh, level splitting, which is two times coupling constant, uh, the coupling strength G. We measure that at the TO phonon frequency. And so the results are summarized in this uh, plot. And all the cavities exhibit uh, splitting that is larger than average losses in the system. So the system is in the strong coupling regime, uh, first of all. But then the normalized coupling strength, that is a uh, G divided by uh, TO phonon frequency, that is uh, about 0.25. So it uh, satisfies the threshold for uh, ultra strong coupling regime. So our system here, it's in the ultra strong coupling regime. So a few representative uh, transmission spectra are shown here, just shifted uh, for clarity. For 21 nanometer gap coax, you can see the absolute transmission is uh, pretty high, about 60% uh, transmission through 20 nanometer gap coax. And you can see uh, this uh, clear um, level splitting. Now, um, when we started uh, these experiments on ultra strong coupling, our initial experiment expectation was uh, based on standard cavity QED with a single emitter. We thought that a, a smaller gap going from 20 to two nanometer gap uh, would mean smaller model volume. So we'd uh, get a larger splitting. But as you can see, it's, it's not the case. Splitting is independent of the gap size. And the theory also confirms that. Now uh, we understand what's going on because you know, we are observing a collective strong coupling um, of all the molecules filling the coaxial cavity. And as explained in some papers, uh, in that case, the coupling strength um, depends on square root of n over v, number of oscillators divided by the modal volume. So when the, the cavity is completely filled with SiO2 film, um, and we shrink the cavity width, then both the number of oscillator and cavity volume uh, decrease uh, um, together. So this coupling strength uh, remains the same regardless of the gap size. So in other words, uh, in a smaller or narrower cavity filled with the same film, that does not boost coupling strength. So looking back, uh, one could say it seems obvious, but um, it was a bit counterintuitive. Now, but um, still, uh, this is uh, um, an interesting uh, regime for future experiments. Uh, if we can achieve ultra strong coupling with very thin film down to one or two nanometers, then um, with small number of molecules, we can reach um, nonlinear effects uh, using lower laser power. 
also when the oxide is very thin, we have other knobs to add, like injecting DC or AC current to modulate the system. So, uh, well, overall, that's a nice thing we learned about um, collective strong coupling in this uh, coaxial resonator. So we have a platform where we can insert the different types of molecules. Another nice feature of coax, all we need is just increase the diameter uh, to tune the resonance toward uh, longer uh, far IR or uh, terahertz range. So we already have made uh, such a coax at terahertz and it opens up interesting opportunity to study um, like, uh, soft phonons and uh, interesting materials transitions. Also, um, coax can be electrically biased as shown in this uh, ETH work. So we are working on a similar kind of route as well as uh, integration with uh, the waveguide. Now I'm, I have just a few minutes left. Um, um, so I'll quickly go through uh, some of the work on um, acoustic plasmas. In a different uh, manner, we can also make a nano cavity using um, graphene. And so and graphene plasmons coupled with the mirror and image charges, we um, obtain acoustic plasmons. They have a linear dispersion at uh, small wave vectors and uh, very high momentum. And um, so this is a, a very interesting mode uh, for uh, enhancing light matter interactions. So acoustic graphene plasmons um, have been observed by many groups. And um, in some of the previous uh, observations, I think one of the, what was desired was to further improve the coupling efficiency. So um, my group uh, worked on that. Uh, we um, started with a continuous graphene layer uh, with a metal ribbons and added a quarter wavelength um, cavity so that we can um, first uh, excite acoustic plasmons and then recycle photon through this cavity structure. So that way, theoretically, we uh, found the ways to uh, reach uh, nearly perfect absorption for TN polarized light. But another element we need is this anti-reflective coding. Uh, and then uh, we spent a um, fair amount of effort to develop a fabrication process to make this a uh, multi-layer structure. Uh, what was necessary was instead of depositing the stack from bottom up, we wanted to maintain a very smooth uh, profile. So we did it backward. We start with a silicon wafer as a template, and then start a ribbon deposition, and then dig optical spacer, and we peel off uh, through template stripping. That way we could present a very smooth surfaces to uh, place graphene. And after optimizing all the design and processes, which took a long time, we have a structure that worked pretty well. So gap size all the way down to three nanometers. And experimentally, uh, we could uh, demonstrate um, coupling efficiency for acoustic plasma all the way uh, to exceeding 90%. And um, of course, the best way to prove that we have acoustic plasma, it's uh, by uh, to do direct uh, near field imaging. So our um, collaborators in Korea, KAIST, uh, Min Sok Jang's group, they used the uh, near spec SNOM to observe uh, acoustic plasmons in uh, a number of different structures for a gap size of eight nanometers and 18 nanometers. More details are in this paper, which was just recently published. And uh, for our initial experiment, uh, we inserted the uh, protein molecules during fabrication. So it, it's not a very practical manner of sensing, but um, that still showed the uh, um, very uh, interesting fact that tightly confined mode uh, enables a very sensitive detection of uh, protein molecules uh, that are extremely thin as expected. And the same structure can be used with a wide range of 2D materials. We have uh, gold ribbons, uh, quarter wavelength uh, cavity for photon recycling. And then the next thing we did was replace graphene with a uh, boron nitride. And that way we couple uh, hyperbolic quantum polaritons with 
the image charge, which we call image polaritons. And as expected, um, and we used also isotopically enriched uh, high quality HBN flake from Jim Edgar's group. We could observe a very high Q factor exceeding 500. And in terms of uh, wavelength compression, effective index uh, was larger than 100. This is a, a latest uh, kind of snow image uh, on the smooth HBN surface uh, that shows this um, field uh, of uh, image polaritons uh, from Josh Caldwell's group. So um, that's a platform we have. And um, let me finish uh, with uh, one slide where we um, have unpublished um, result. And so back to ultra strong coupling. Can we use a uh, acoustic plasmon uh, resonator for ultra strong coupling? And we know it's, it should be possible. Now the changing the process to incorporate SiO2 film, it took a, a long time and then this uh, COVID and shutdown. So, um, but we, we have a, a very promising result. So this is the latest result where we have um, uh, bilayer silica alumina bilayer um, in the gap region and uh, the coupling strength uh, we measured in this case is uh, just um, normalized coupling is just about a 0.1 so we um, are very close to the ultra strong coupling um, limit and that's where things are um, so both coaxial resonator and uh, acoustic plasmon resonator in this case we are observing uh, ultra strong coupling between acoustic graphene plasmon and uh, SiO2 phonons in very thin film so there's a lot of interesting um, uh, questions and challenges um, it's a uh, kind of our long-term goal a work in progress uh, and an interesting potential applications of ultra strong coupling is so called the dynamic Casimir effect. Um, so we start with a modified ground state, and then in this early paper by uh, GOP, they mentioned uh, possible modulation through electrical gating. So just uh, convert this uh, virtual um, ground state virtual photons into radiation. And in the um, circuit QED uh, field, the superconducting circuit was used to experimentally demonstrate that effect. So um, this acoustic plasmon platform shows an interesting um, possibility. Uh, we need a very fast modulation. So uh, it's not clear whether we can achieve that uh, at this uh, frequency regime, but if you go to lower frequency of uh, terahertz or so, uh, possible ways. So I think, this is where things are uh, still work in progress, but um, ultra strong coupling, we are just um, kind of scratching the surface of this uh, field. Um, but we are already seeing a lot of interesting questions. Uh, yeah, you have to stop now. Yep. Uh, well, thank you very much for a very interesting talk and uh, it was getting more and more interesting by the end. And, uh, uh, there is a question, uh, well, uh, let's have uh, just one question, even though we are out of time. Uh, from Ben Chen, uh, thanks for the wonderful talk. I noticed that in your work about the ultra strong coupling and molecule detection, silicon was used as a substrate. As the silicon also seems near the hotspot region, how did you exclude the infrared absorption signal of silicon substrate? from the signal of the analyte in the gap? Uh, for, uh, for ultra strong coupling and molecule, uh, we used uh, in some cases a sapphire, but uh, in this work, yeah, we used the silicon, undoped um, silicon wafer. Um, the IR absorption signal of silicon yeah. substrate uh, from the, so I guess analyte means, SI, I'm not sure which one. Um, yeah, we can um, distinguish those uh, um, two signals. So we always, uh, and we normal, we use a reference, a silicon wafer to subtract and normalize the signal. So. Okay, well, uh, thank you for, for the talk. We have to move on and I will invite the next speaker, 
Peter uh, Rabel from Technical University of Wien uh, with the talk, uh, Thermodynamics of Ultra Strongly Coupled Light Matter System. Yeah, okay, so I hope you can see me, my screen and everything. Okay, so uh, let me also uh, start with thanking the organizers for putting together this, this nice online workshop. Of course, it would be much nicer to be in Benask in, in person. Uh, I would also like to start with uh, thanking my collaborators, in particular here, Philip Villa and uh, Daniele De Banadis. So Philip was a previous student of mine and Daniele is, is just finishing his PhD and he's also uh, attending this conference and these two guys have pretty much done the work that I present today. Okay, so kind of the topic uh, I want to discuss today is, is related to something what we can call a uh, vacuum induced modifications of matter. And um, you probably have, have heard about these ideas. Okay, so people are currently very interested in, 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 in the fact, in the question, can we have some materials, some, some molecules or solids and put them in a cavity, couple them very strongly to a cavity and modify the properties of these solids, okay? And in principle, we know that this is possible if you have a cavity which we drive from outside. But the key question now is, can this also happen in vacuum, okay? So without any external driving fields. And this type of question has certainly created a lot of excitations, but also you know, some questions. And, and immediately, if you, if you just uh, think about the setup, you might wonder, I mean, is this possible, okay? Can we add a single electromagnetic degree of freedom and change the, the properties of a macroscopic body, okay? Does this make sense? And these are the type of, of question I want to address today. So of course, uh, as I mentioned before, there, there's a lot of work in, in this direction. And, uh, but what somehow happens the last few years is that, that people kind of try to answer this question always with more and more complicated uh, systems. And I think this is maybe a little bit counterproductive because we're still thinking about fundamental principles, fun fundamental properties. So what I want to do in this talk is now to go the opposite limit and actually um, talk about, uh, consider a system which is as simple as possible. So this is just now a bunch of two level dipoles, okay, which just have two internal states, coupled to a single electromagnetic mode, which I here represent in terms of this LC resonance. And now I want to really, I mean, having this minimal model, the simple question is just, you know, what is actually the thermodynamics of such a cavity QED system? Okay, so if you now go a little bit uh, in detail, so that's the starting point from, from this, this whole uh, modeling and discussion will be a set of two level dipoles. Okay, so this is just some uh, degrees of freedom ordered and arranged on a lattice. So there are some charges, and I simply assume that these charges are described by some effective degree of freedom that, for example, lives in, in this double well potential, such that there are two isolated lowest levels. Okay, so this is uh, the frequency splitting here of omega zero. So then I can write the Hamiltonian. So this is just this two level, uh, level splitting here, omega zero. And then of course, because I have dipoles, okay, I have electric uh, charges around. I also have electrostatic interactions, electrostatic dipole-dipole interactions, which in free space will simply scale like one over this uh, R to the power three. Okay, so this is my, my starting point. And now I want to take these dipoles and put them in, into a cavity, into a box, okay? And in the first step, I do so by shortening these two capacitor plates, meaning that there is, is no electromagnetic excitation, okay? All frequencies are, are much higher than, than the system frequencies of this interest. Okay, so now what happens? Because I now confine my dipoles, okay? So uh, usually this confinement is done by some metallic plates. This means that I have something like image charges. So um, effectively, this, this type of dipole interactions will get modified when I put dipoles between the plates, when I put them in a box. Okay, that's the first important observation. And I mean, in many uh, experiments or in many systems, this actually is a small effect. But if we now talk really about very short distances, okay, when the distance between dipoles and the cavity is, is of order one, you know, so this effect, this renormalization of, of the dipole-dipole interactions can be significant. And what is maybe uh, even more important here is illustrated for this kind of layered structure. So suppose I have these layered structures and now bring the, 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 the plates, the metallic plates closer and closer. I can really change from a system where the average dipole-dipole interaction is repulsive to something where the average dipole-dipole interaction is attractive. Okay, so this would in principle mean that by taking such a, a type of system and simply putting now between two plates, I can change from a situation where the system is maybe paraelectric 
to something where uh, I have a ferro ferroelectric state. And this is, uh, I mean, there are uh, other fields and, 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 uh, and, and people who worry, uh, worry about this for a long time, but I think also in this context, this is always a little bit uh, overlooked. So by simply confining a system, okay, in a small cavity, I can change the material properties, okay? I can, for example, take this, these plates and induce a phase transition, which would not be there in, in free space, but at this stage, everything here is purely electrostatic, okay? So, and that is not what we, what we are interested in here. So instead, I will now take a, a next step and kind of allow a dynamic degree, degree of freedom, okay? So now I connect these two plates by some inductor. This means I have electromagnetic fields, electric magnetic fields that oscillate on a time scale that is comparable with the dipole dynamics, okay? So this is now an independent dynamical uh, degree of freedom. Okay, so to, to have this type of, of, of system, now my total Hamiltonian for the system is kind of the dipoles I had before, you know, including maybe these boundary effects, um, these modif modified uh, double interactions, and the energy of this dynamical field mode. And because I'm working with this uh, simple LC uh, uh, circuit setup, okay, the energy is actually easy to write down. So I have a voltage difference here and I have some magnetic flux. So I just add to this uh, previous Hamiltonian a C times V squared over two and a phi squared two L. So this is in principle already uh, correct. That's the energy of the system. But the problem is that these two quantities are not canonical variables. Okay, I cannot uh, really quantize, uh, use them to quantize my theory with this. So here I have to do uh, one final step, and maybe this is a little bit of a busy slide, but uh, just the, the main point here is that the actual canonical variable that is uh, so the canonical momentum, to, so to say, in, in such a theory that is canonical due to the flux is the total charge on the capacitor plate. And here it's important that this charge has two contributions, okay? So on one hand, I can apply a voltage difference across the plates, and then I usually have these this charges, you know, Q is just uh, capacitance type times the voltage. But then I also, because I have now dipoles inside this capacitor, they can all, uh, they have another induced charges over here. And these induced charges exist even for voltage equals zero, okay? And these induced charges just uh, written up here are proportional to the dipole moments to the collective dipole operator which here is just the, the sum of the sigma operators, which I denote by Sx. Okay, so this Sx is the collective dipole operator of, of my material property. And then in the end, okay, I can now rewrite my, my Hamiltonian, simply express my voltage here as the total charge. So that's the canonical variable minus these induced dipoles and these induced, so induced charge, that's essentially the dipole, the material system. And once I'm at this level, okay, now I can uh, take Q and, and, and phi and do the usual quantization and replace them by harmonic oscillator creation annihilation operator. Okay, so the final step is now simply put in here this, this A plus A dagger and multiply out this, this square. And what I end up with is then this the, the following kind of uh, Hamiltonian for, the, for this minimal system. So the first line is again, it's the electrostatic energy. So it's the, the, that's the usual form H bar omega C A dagger A. And then I have a coupling to the meta part, so A plus A dagger coupled to the SX, so the collective dipole. And because, and again, I mean, let me go back to this slide, because I have expressed here this voltage in terms of the, the canonical charge minus the induced charge, if I multiply out this square, I not only get this coupling term, but I also get this, um, this correction term. So this is kind of a P square term, some, something depolarization shift square, uh, term, sometimes, sometimes called. But these uh, all three terms go together and form the energy of the electromagnetic mode. And the second line is the bare in you know, is the, the energy of the dipoles as we had before. Again, the free dipoles plus eventually modifications uh, due to the boundary included in this electrostatic coupling. Okay, so this is kind of my minimal model I want, want to consider to, to, to study such KVD QED systems. And just to, uh, to move on, okay, so maybe I uh, think that's a very uh, special case. I have this LC resonator. So let me just emphasize that this type of Hamiltonian is, is completely universal, okay? So you can have quantum, uh, quantum wells, uh, some system molecules coupled to plus one spheres, also superconducting circuits of different type. So as, as soon as we have two level systems and a single mode, then this is pretty much the only way you can write down your model. And the only difference now between all these cases 
is the actual form of this electrostatic type of dipole interactions, which is really a system dependent uh, property. Okay, so this is kind of now the, the type of model I, I want, to, want to study. And now let's take simply this uh, simple, simple system and put it now, heat it up essentially. And this is of course something we usually don't do in quantum optics where everything is at, at equal zero. Uh, so let me just uh, briefly remind you. So what we now want to do is to look at thermal equilibrium states. So in this case, what we're interested in, okay, so we, we start with this Hamiltonian up here. And if you want to calculate equilibrium properties, uh, what we do is we take, first of all, take this Hamiltonian and calculate the partition function set. So we take trace over e to the minus uh, beta h. And from this partition function, we then uh, calculate the free energy by taking the logarithm of it. And in the following, and now I will take now this free energy. So that's the quantity of interest. And more precisely, I will write this free energy in, in a contribution which is just concerns the dipoles by itself, okay, the free dipoles, one part, which is just the cavity. And this means that everything else that is, uh, so if I take this F, subtract these two contributions, then everything else is kind of like coupling induced uh, modifications, okay? So this is now really the, the, the question, what is the contribution that comes only from the coupling and is not there in the bare system? Okay, so um, maybe here a, a small uh, technicality. So in principle, I can follow this procedure, but in general, this is very difficult uh, to evaluate, uh, to solve. So what uh, we do in this type of work, we replace this, uh, this, this uh, dipole dipole interactions by some simpler form where kind of, where, which is an all to all dipole interaction. Okay, every uh, dipole talks the same to, to, uh, to all the other dipoles. And the reason why to do is because if I have such a Hamiltonian, I have permutation symmetry and I can uh, simplify the complex problem of calculating this huge partition function. I can divide it into smaller subsectors. And effectively, this means that on a regular computer, you can now solve this, uh, these problems now with something like 100 dipoles, which is not you know, infinite, but uh, it's kind of a macroscopic number of dipoles. And then we have kind of exact results, which we can use to compare other type of approximation schemes. Okay, so this is the, the general setting, but let me actually now, first of all, don't do exact results, but do something where we get a little bit more intuition and more, more understanding. And again, I emphasize that the, the Hamiltonian, which describes the coupling between light and matter is of this form, so you have these two terms, uh, linear and the quadratic in G. And of course, the uh, first thing we, we can ask, I mean, what actually happens if this interaction is small? Okay, so in this sense, we can do some sort of perturbation theory and get some more insight. So, I mean, usually, okay, perturbation theory, often we think about Hamiltonian perturbation theory. Here we talk about the free energy. So it's the type of expressions we get is a little bit different than what we may be used for, to from regular quantum mechanics. And please don't look now at the, at the details here. It's just that, uh, just to show that, you know, in the end of the day, we can calculate now this free energy, this coupling contribution up to second order in, the, in this G squared. And uh, the, the thing that we, we end up with are these integrals of kind of correlation functions, thermal correlation functions, but which are now only depend on the bare cavity and the bare dipole system. Okay, so this is something we can then uh, address more systematically. So uh, one uh, also advantage of having this perturbation theory is that we can now uh, write this, this free energy as something which is, has a scaling factor in front and some other part which is dimensionless and non-extensive. Okay, so we take all the, all, the, all the scaling, all the energy scales out, out front and we have something that's left over. And now, uh, for example, now we can look at this, this F, FG, okay, kind of this uh, normalized uh, Free, free density. And now in some simple cases, and this is now the, the case of completely non-indecting dipoles, okay, so just, uh, just the free dipoles, put them in a cavity. And in this case, we can even find exact solutions. Okay, so again, this, this, this expression might not tell you anything, or at least doesn't tell me anything, but I just want to remind you that, I mean, once I have this free energy, I can derive all other quantities of, of, of this physical system, okay? So at least in certain limits, we really have now uh, exact analytic results that we can then also use as benchmark to, uh, in order to discuss other type of, of more complicated uh, cases. But what is maybe more important here, we can also use this type of, uh, of uh, strategy or expression here 
to put certain bounds, which are now valid for also for interacting diapers, so arbitrary complicated systems. Okay, so we can uh, derive a bound for this for this small uh, uh, this, this free energy here, which is given here by the variance of this this collective dipole operator. But uh, it turns out, you know, if you're not if you are in a, in a system which has a finite correlation length, then this this guy, you know, essentially also scales like n. And at the end of the day, we end up with a bound which is typically of order one. Okay, so let me now have, uh, I mean, make two uh, remarks about these bounds. Okay, so and first of all, look at the lower bound that, that we see here. So this means that this correction of the free energy is positive. And here, I just want to point out so that's something you, you see in, in several papers and, and throughout the literature. So you see this type of, of pictures, so it is just example here where you have some material property, uh, some material with two uh, ground and excited state, you couple it to the cavity, and then this cavity, the excited state splits up in the polariton branches, as, as you know it, and the ground state is lowered by a certain energy. And this kind of, uh, this type of picture is, is in principle correct in the sense that the, the energy of the materials of the, of the dipoles is lowered, but one should not forget that at the same time, the energy of the cavity mode is increased. And, these, and, and if you're talking about thermodynamic properties, we have to account for both effects. And it turns out then, then the combination, so the lowering of the dipole energy and the increase of the cavity uh, energy turns out to be positive. Okay, So if we couple a system to a cavity, we increase the free energy of the system. OK, so what about the, uh, the upper bound? OK, and for, for this, I would now I'd like to introduce here this collective coupling and maybe concerning also the, the previous talk, let me just clarify. So the small coupling G I use in my talk is the coupling of single dipole to the cavity. So if you have now an ensemble, what is relevant, what people talk about usually is this collective coupling G times square root of N. And this is also, we have seen in the last talk, this is often fixed, you know, because if you increase the volume, you increase this N, but at the same time, the G goes down and vice versa. Okay, so this is something we have usually have that's kind of a fixed property. And we can now, taking this value fixed, we can now ask the question, what happens to the free energy per particle in the thermodynamic limit? OK, so we take this expression. We rewrite it in the form we had before. So I introduce now this capital G. I introduce this small quantity here. And now we use this bound saying that this F you know, is, doesn't scale with n. It's just uh, order 1, which means that you know, if I take now the limit F uh, n to infinity, that this quantity actually goes to zero. So what does it mean? It means that a single cavity mode does not modify material properties or thermodynamical properties in the thermodynamic limit. And this is in principle also expected, OK? I mean, as, as I mentioned in the very beginning, if you have a big system, many degrees of freedom, we add just one more degree of freedom, even if the coupling is very strong, it should not have a big effect on, on, on the, the properties of the whole system. OK, so this is, let's say, one important conclusion we can already draw here. So it's very general uh, remark here. But um, what I also want to, uh, want to emphasize here, so everything I did so far, this is the last few slides, were done in perturbation theory, OK? Use the small g expansion. So and the question is, I mean, how is this valid actually in, in the regime of interest? Is this valid in the ultra strong coupling regime? And for this, we can now take this, this exact results, uh, these, these approximate results, that's the, the red line here, and compare it also with exact calculations. And we see that actually this perturbation theory is really valid to so the point we can, um, uh, uh, we can uh, probe it with ex compare it with exact results. is really, really valid up to the point where this t is an order omega c, you know, even here, much, much larger. So this means that this perturbation uh, theory that I just, just uh, sketched a little bit can really be used to do exact analytic results in the collective ultra strong coupling regime. And this is actually the regime where most experiments are in or operated in today. OK, so this was kind of the, the first part uh, about perturbative uh, uh, effects. But OK, if there's a perturbative regime, there's usually then also a number derivative regime. And this, this brings me now to number derivative cavity QED effect meaning what actually happens if this small g, so this coupling per dipole, per dipole, is on the order of the cavity frequency. And to discuss now th this situation, let me introduce a, a simple example, a simple, uh, simple uh, showcase. And this is the uh, zero field susceptibility. 
So uh, what I def uh, as defined here, so you probably know this quantity from a magnetism. Okay, so this is just the polarization of my dipoles as a function if I vary now the, the, the frequency or the applied external field. And uh, so this, 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 this variance, but now applied also at zero frequency. And the reason why this is uh, interesting, or why we look at this quantity, it's, it's, you know, it's a very simple, uh, simple quantity to calculate. And especially if I now switch off the coupling to the cavity and also the uh, coupling between the dipoles, I recover that this, is, this will simply give me the Curie law. Okay, so this susceptibility of a non interacting system of thermal dipoles uh, will just give me a constant uh, divided by the temperature. Okay, so this is uh, the, the bare system, but now let me uh, switch now on the, the coupling to cavity. And again, I mean, this is now some, some exact results. So we first reproduce the, the result at, at g equals zero, which just gives me this one over t scaling. And I can now switch on the coupling and I see some modification. I switch on the coupling even more, see more modification. And yeah, and in the end of the day, this, this straight line here has really turned quite a bit around. So in the end, uh, there are now two effects that you, that you see here, okay? So, so first of all, uh, if we go to very low temperatures, we still see this one over T scaling, okay? So the, the fact that this Curie law, which in principle is valid always at low temperatures, uh, is, is still the same um, in this asymptotic limit, okay? T going to, to zero, this will still scale like one over T, but now with a different kind, kind of prefactor. So we have now that this Curie constant, which is, uh, for g equals zero, it's somewhere up here, really gets renormalized uh, a lot by the cavity and drops dramatically. But this is not the only fact, okay? So this would still kind of this uh, one over t that's still independent dipoles, but we also have, see here, a plateau emerging, okay? And this type of physics can no longer be explained by, by simply independent dipoles, okay? So something in addition must happen here. Okay, so at this stage, uh, the question is, how can we explain these results? And here I also have to make a little bit um, a jump or let's say a jump back to some, some, uh, some older works of, uh, of ours. So we are now working actually in this very, uh, so in this ultra strong coupling regime. So let me go back here. So we now really want to, to work in this, when this G is, 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 is bigger than one. And similar to the, to the effect, so similar to the consequence that you can do perturbation theory in small g, you can also do perturbation theory in the very large g limit. And if you do so, the effective cavity QED Hamiltonian you get will be of this form. And let me just uh, talk now, so this is the cavity frequency that's, that's uh, as, as before. And then we have kind of these two terms. And let me first look at this first term, okay? So that, that's just uh, the, the level splitting as set, level splitting, but with a modified frequency here. And how can I interpret this, uh, this frequency? So if you think about a dipole in, in, in this LC circuit, okay, and you polarize the dipole along a certain direction, it, you will have this alignment of the dipole and associated with this, this image charges on the plates. So now the, the dipole, of course, want to oscillate, so it will oscillate in the other direction. And here we have essentially the same configuration. It has the same, the same energy. But now you see that you know, from going from this configuration over here, not only the dipole has to change, but also these image charges have to flow around, go through the inductor, induce some, some effect, and, and come over here. Okay, so you can imagine that, I mean, if I have a, a dipole which oscillates freely, uh, in, with, oscillates with omega zero in free space, then by having these this other charges that he, it has to track around, it will kind of renormalize, lower the frequency, and this is kind of a typical polar, polar, polaronic uh, frequency renormalization or a simple a consequent of mass renormalization in, in QED. Okay, so this is one effect, but there's also an, an, another contribution. Uh, this is this part over here. And if you think, for example, about two typos or more typos, what, what uh, another thing that can happen is, is if you start from this configuration, that you will flip one of the dipoles so going up here. And this is now a high and en uh, uh, um, energ uh, energetically higher state. Okay, so this is uh, some virtual state. So you cannot do this resonantly. So it, this costs some energy. And therefore, in the second process, you must go back, back here. 
So you see, this is kind of now second order process in, in this frequency, in this dipole frequency. That's why I also have this, this omega over here. And this gives me, I mean, the, the, the initial and the final configurations are the same, but uh, they will have an energy shift. And now if you have two or even then more dipoles, I mean, there are a lot of different ways how you can do these transitions to these excited states and come back. And then and at this stage, okay, um, the, uh, you know, my classical intuition uh, stops, okay? I don't have a good explanation. So to, to, to find out what's really going on, you simply have to do the math and you find out the correction term of this form. And if you just focus now on, the, on this first part here, because that's the relevant. So this means there's a positive uh, frequency shift uh, that goes with SX squared. That this, this means that this type of processes that happen now in the cavity will induce a collective anti electric coupling. Okay, so you start with non inducting dipoles, the frequency is renormalized, but the cavity through this type of virtual processes also adds this collective all to all interactions between the dipoles. And this is now, okay, so this taking now this model and doing some simply uh, simple calculations of, of, of the thermal states of this model, we can now really kind of uh, predict an elliptic form for this, for this susceptibility. And you see here, these are uh, these dashed lines. And essentially see that, you know, especially this, this Curie constant, this drop off is really explained by this uh, frequency normalization up here. So this is more or less exact. But also we see that from this interaction term, that's important, we find the existence of, of these plateaus. Okay, so really this type of effective models uh, really explain kind of what's going on in such a system. And yeah, so, and maybe the, the, the final point or then the important point what you really want to make here is if I now go back, what is actually the definition of this, this chi that I plot here, okay? So this is kind of the, the total population, but divided by N, okay? This is a normalized quantity. So this means if this thing drops, then the, the properties of the, uh, of the whole uh, ensemble of dipole drops, okay? So this is really a macroscopic property. So it's not only that one degree of freedom changes, but the whole ensemble drops, so the, the thermodynamics of the whole ensemble is modified here on the order of one, so more or less by 100% if you look at this, this drop of, of, of this uh, Curie constant. And okay, so this is one example. You can then go on and, and look at, uh, at other quantities. So for example, here, this is the, the specific heat. So the, the, the heat capacity, again, normalized to, uh, to all the particles, the normalized to one and uh, normalized to n. And again, I see that this uh, heat capacity, uh, cap uh, capacity per particle reaches of the order one, okay? So again, this is an indication that you change the thermodynamics of the whole body by simply adding a single degree of freedom. And finally, you can also now look at situations where this J is not zero, so for example, negative. In this case, the system has a, a, a transition between a paraelectric and, and a ferroelectric state. And also, again, in this, this case, we see if you now switch on this coupling and change it from small to this order one, we see a, a change in the transition temperature and of this phase transition, so where the, the state switches from paraelectric to ferroelectric. And again, this change of the, this transition temperature is not just perturbative, but it's really a quantity of all of one. Okay, so these are now some examples. I mean, uh, at this stage, I should also um, emphasize some related works that, uh, that, uh, that appeared in, in this type of, uh, of topic. Um, um, I just want, want to say, I mean, in, in this works, I mean, it suggested that this type of uh, change in temperature can also happen at, 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 at lower G. At this stage, we cannot confirm this by, by our theory, okay? So that um, is, not, is not contained in this more general analysis here. Okay, um, I think if, okay, if I have just maybe a few more minutes uh, to conclude or let me just conclude and maybe emphasize again the, the main points. Okay, so I was now rushing a little bit to, to all these, these points, but let me just emphasize a few uh, main conclusions. Okay, so I mean, the whole analysis I did was, was based on this kind of uh, model for KVD QD, which certainly has a lot of uh, idealization, okay, two level system, uh, single mode, and so on. But one should not forget that every, all these things, I mean, they can be macroscopically derived. Okay, there's a step by step derivation behind this. Um, and this type of model then allows us to do exact analytic and numerical analysis, which you know, in more complicated systems is no longer possible. Okay, so this is then fully under control what we do. And I think the last point is also that we have here this explicit distinction between dynamical effects and purely electrostatic effect. 
So this allows us also to interpret the results we see in a more consistent manner than, uh, than is sometimes done in the literature. So then based on this model, we found that in the collective ultra-strong coupling regime, you know, where, where most uh, experiments work these days, uh, I mean, we can do some semi-analytic results. So we have this perturbation theory, which simplifies the system. We can do explicit calculations and for, for finite size system. And, uh, but also, I mean, we can show now through these bounds, okay, that these cavity induced modifications um, go away when we really take the thermodynamic limit. And this in principle, not, again, it's not surprising. It also uh, has been pointed out, similar type of uh, calculations have been done in previous work, uh, similar conclusions. I think the main advantage is now that we here calculate directly the free energy. So this concerns now all type of uh, thermodynamic properties in the system. Okay, but um, again, this is the thing that where people uh, mainly work in, but then I want to emphasize, I mean, in principle, it's possible, you know, if you took a uh, look at all these plasmonic nanostructures or go to circuit QD, where we have this, this uh, super inductors, in principle, we can build cavities with the high impedance, which then is possible to compensate for the small, uh, High structure constant which determines this coupling ratio and by really now going so, to some uh, these extreme cavities uh, it's, it's at least in theory possible to go to this regime where it's of order one and in this case i have then uh, told you and, and shown you now some explicit examples where really the, 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 the coupling of a single degree of freedom leads to this uh, very surprising effect that the coupling induced modifications are on the order of the bare system and we really have order one modifications of material properties. So these are some sim simple examples. We then have also some par parallel studies where we don't look at thermodynamics, but in the ground state, where we can then solve also the short range dynamics and solve this, pro uh, this problem now fully numerically. And in this case, you find even there are a lot more surprising uh, phases uh, that appear now in, in this ultra strong coupling regime, but this is uh, not uh, it's too much for the day. So with this, I actually would like to, uh, you know, simply show some final nice, nice pictures without talking about them, about the black body spectrum that would be emitted from such a cavity. And uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. Yeah, okay, Peter. thank you very much for the great talk. Uh, and uh, you have uh, quite a number of questions, but uh, we don't have time. I will just ask uh, this first question because uh, even though it's long, maybe the, the answer would be short. So the first question from Wimba, there is only email address. Very nice talk. When you consider the quantization of the electromagnetic system, you take as the canonical variable Q to allow the dipole to exchange in contrast with the system, the energy spectrum of the field associated with this Q canonical variable should be discrete. Is this a fair assumption? since Q looks very much like a microscopic object. Um, it's okay, I'm not sure if I completely understand it. I think this, this was about, so at this stage, okay, we, we treat the, 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 the charge as, 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 a, um, as a continuous uh, de degree of freedom. And um, I think this is, uh, this is justified or also uh, the same happens in, in superconducting circuits. If you quantize superconducting circuits, in general, I mean, unless you are in the in the regime where charge charge interactions on the plate are dominant, then it's it's usually a good approximation. Okay, so it's um, I mean, one can go to a regime where the discreteness of the charge will be relevant, but as long as the capacitance of, of these plates is is kind of big enough, then this uh, this is a fair assumption. And I would also say, okay, at this stage we have a simplified model. Uh, on top of this, you can then look at, at more details, have, uh, have the electrons modeled uh, more precisely and so on there. Yeah. But I think it, it's uh, the first approximation, it's, it's, a good, it's a good assumption for these systems we consider. Okay, Peter, thank you very much. Uh, we have to move on and uh, I'd like to invite the next speaker, uh, Michael Ford from uh, Ludwig Maximilian University of München. Uh, with the talk uh, regimes of light matter interaction in open microcavity system. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. And I also would like to thank the organizers for putting together this very diverse and interesting conference. So as already uh, mentioned, I'm part of the QLIBRI project here at LMU Munich. 
And basically we uh, stem from three research groups. So for one from the research group of David Hunger, who is now at KIT, and from the research groups of Alexander Hügele and Pat Hensch here at LMU. And the spin-off project now tries to convert the last 10 years of research upon open microcavity systems into a standalone product in the end. Today, I would like to uh, talk about different regimes of light matter interaction you can actually uh, see in these open microcavity systems, starting with the very simple uh, regime of absorption. So if you have a nanoscale object, and it's small enough, normally uh, the absorption properties of these are very weak. But if you put a surrounding resonator, you can drastically enhance this absorption feature and unveiling really novel types of absorption microscopy techniques there and seeing novel features. If you rather would like to uh, investigate your emission, of course, your nanoparticle uh, can, also couple, uh, can also couple to the light by emitting it. And if you now, um, this emission goes into your micro resonator, it can be enhanced. For one, in the regime of weak coupling. And if now these two processes of absorption and emission happen in a coherent way, so the phase information is not lost, you would enter the regime of strong coupling. Today, I would like to give examples upon all these different regimes. But before digging into the scientific details, I want to um, show you how, which sort of resonator we use, or even more, what are requirements for a good resonator. So it, for, for daily lab work, it's nice if you have a resonator that where you can easily prepare your sample. You just spin coat, stamped, uh, drop cast it on your uh, system, and then measure. It's also nice if you can um, access different sample positions, or even if you can like have live images for orientation on your surface. Uh, of course, for coupling to your um, nanoparticles, you want to have small mode volumes. And depending on the emission features of your nanoparticles, high finesse values. And it's also uh, of great uh, advantage if you can now fast and wide tune your resonator. So the system we want to use is based on the um, tip of an optical fiber, which is uh, tapered down, and the end facet um, is uh, here shaped in a way that we imprint a concave depression. Now on this uh, end facet, we add a highly reflective coating, forming a concave mirror in the end. And if this mirror now uh, faces a macroscopic mirror on the other side, you get a stable resonator condition with your uh, resonator mode that is laterally confined. This gives you the opportunity to transversely scan your surface. And there comes the third ingredient for your uh, system, the nanoscale objects. Now you really can dedicatedly go to your single objects and uh, change your length or scan them. A very simple measurement, as I already said, is just to look for absorption. And here I want to give an example of carbon nanotubes. Uh, so carbon nanotubes are one dimensional cylinders made of carbon atoms. You could imagine like a sheet of graphene rolled up onto a certain di uh, direction. They have a diameter of 1.4 nanometers in this case, and with conventional methods like wide field microscopy or confocally, they are not visible in absorption. But if we now have our resonator system, you can detect the transmission of it. And uh, if uh, you can see here, the transmission is a function of the transmission of the two mirrors and their loss rates as well as of the extinction happening between the mirrors. So if these numbers, you, uh, if you know these numbers and they are sufficiently small, you get very sensitive to the extinction. And that's what you now get uh, on your sample surface. So currently uh, the current system can make such a two dimensional image on uh, the, within one second, like uh, 60 by 60 microns. And you see really directly and live use a single carbon nanotubes lying on your substrate. Of course, it's, this is nice for orientation, but then you can get one, go one step further and detect also the spectra of your individual tubes. So you tune your laser through, over the resonance of the individual carbon nanotubes and see um, the absorption spectra of those individual features. You now are confused by the different scales. So this is uh, already published a few years ago. 
And this is a, another experiment which uh, where the manuscript is currently written. So. A material platform uh, which is more in the focus of uh, last year's research are two-dimensional materials, especially if you can make heterostructures out of them. So in this case, we investigated molydiselenide, tungsten diselenide heterostructure. So both of them are part of the family of transition metal dichalcogenides. And these uh, materials are direct band gap semiconductor if you have single layers of them, like shown here. Now, if you put them on top of each other, like here, um, the band alignment will be in a way that you have this type two band alignment where electrons tend to go to the one layer and holes to the other. And in the end, you end up with these um, new sort of quasi particles called interlayer excitons. So these are bound particles, but electron and whole wave function are separated into the two layers. This leads for one, uh, leads for one to very long lifetimes, but for the other, they absorb light only very weakly. That's why we put the structure again into our micro resonator and did spatial maps. So here you can see uh, such maps. So uh, the outer edges, there are like uh, highly scattering uh, edge, edges where coming from the growth process of the material. And in the interior triangle, we really could see the absorption of our interlayer excitons. And we couldn't only see this uh, uh, for, uh, for one polarization, but for both polarization inside our resonator system. And we could detect differences. So here you can see horizontal lines that are a bit less pronounced here. There's more like a diagonal line. And that's why we uh, said, OK, let's do spectra uh, for these two different polarizations again. So we tuned our, uh, our laser over the resonance of these interlayer excitons. And for one, we could see the onset of absorption happening, which was, for one, really, uh, really new. And for the other, we could see that the <clears throat> interlayer excitons here have polarization dependent features. And this, in the beginning, it was not clear. It became clear last year where uh, we saw a publication of the group of um, Tatakovsky, where they showed that if you have strained materials, you really get a strongly linearly polarized emission out of this. And now we could do the same just with the absorption protection. Of course, in the quantum optics community, um, you may be not so interested in absorption. You really want to interact with your material. And that's um, also possible with these micro cavities. Here, an example uh, of uh, carbon nanotubes Raman features. So again, a two-dimensional uh, scan of these nanotubes inside the cavity emitting uh, Raman photons, where my colleague, uh, went to a certain position with an intermediate emission and then uh, coupled to the resonator mode. So um, the red line is the emission into the micro cavity, whereas the blue line would be uh, the emission, confocal emission, uh, Raman emission at the very same position. So you really can see that um, you can do per cell enhancement with our micro cavities. And as indicated by this formula, the per cell enhancement is a function of your mode volume, of course. So now you uh, can use the tunability of these uh, re micro resonators to um, map out the per cell enhancement as a function of your cavity length, as, your, uh, as a function of your mode volume, and see how this really goes up. Uh, and in the end, can also choose the per cell enhancement you want to have. Of course, um, Doing quantum optics means you don't want to uh, ha only have enhancement of Raman photons, but you want to enhance in emitters that have single photon emission properties. Here, another colleague of mine, um, she actually investigated nano diamonds with silicon vacancy centers inside. So there were like nano diamonds lying on the mirror. And these silicon vacancy centers have now um, single photon emission properties. You can see uh, spectrally, they are a uh, little bit distinct. Uh, but uh, the tunability of our resonator now enables to go to each of those resonances uh, very quickly. 
but before coupling to them, um, you do again a two-dimensional scan in order to detect really the tiniest features here, which are the single crystals where these points would really be um, accumulation of materials. And then in the end, again, um, you can uh, decrease your mode volume and measure the lifetime in this case and see how the intracavity lifetimes in comparison with the free space emission are uh, really enhanced. Of course, you cannot only couple to single photon emitters, but also to ensembles of them. Here again, for the example of this molybdenum diselenide tungsten diselenide heterostructures. So if you um, uh, look at the emission features of these uh, interlayer excitons uh, for these grown uh, CVD grown materials at cryogenic temperatures, you see a very intense but very broad emission peak. Inside this uh, emission peak, there are different transitions, which one knows from other experiments. And now we used again our open microcavity system to couple to them, despite they're so broad. So what we did, um, we put it into the microcavity now at cryogenic temperatures and detected uh, the uh, emission as a function of cavity length again. So we decreased the cavity length from 35 microns to six and saw how uh, these uh, emission really drops. And now from these uh, decay time traces, you can calculate the time constants of these individual components and see if you do it as a function of cavity length again, how they all, uh, all of them go down. And in the end, you can model this uh, decrease of decay with this model of uh, Purcell enhancement in the regime of high defacing where gamma free space is your decay rate of the free space emitting cavity decay rate and your defacing rate of the emitter and you get out your coupling rate. Now, if this coupling rate gets now bigger and bigger and it even overcomes the defacing rate of your material, you enter the regime of strong coupling. Here, I would like to give an example of a uh, tungsten disulfide monolayer is strongly coupled to our microcavity. So in, in these monolayers, there are again uh, strongly bound excitons, which now have very uh, strong light matter interaction properties. So if you do a spatial map of such a grown material, you see for the one they grow in a nicely triangular shape due to their symmetry, and for the other they have high emission, and uh, if you match the absorption, also high absorption properties. If you now tune the uh, open scanning microcavity into resonance with, these, uh, with the optical transition, you see how the modes split up and you have the exciton polaritons. Now, you cannot only detect these polaritons, but you really can map them out with this uh, scannability of the resonator. So what you can do, you can use your triangle and measure the light matter coupling at each position and get uh, like a map of your coupling or also of the uh, central um, energy of your coupling. Then you go farther away where you're out of the strong coupling regime and detect your absorption, like the height and um, the central energy again. Or you uh, can use a different laser and detect the photoluminescence. So like also the intensity and the full width half max. And in the end, you can then correlate these individual measurements with each other uh, and see, for example, that if you have a small line width, your coupling is high. So the cool thing about this, all these measurements can be done without putting the sample out of the resonator. But you also can uh, use this length tunability even more and have a closer look at the coupling, so at the polaritons. So you can, for example, go to the mode order six here and see how, uh, if you go into resonance, the level splits up. If you're uh, at zero detuning, your lower polariton branch has a higher population than the upper one. And then you go to the next mode order, like seven, and see how this population suddenly is equal. So this was uh, really, really confusing in the beginning. And that's why one now put uh, the, here the splitting energy or the mode orders uh, to the po polariton population ratio. So we mapped out this ratio for each uh, mode order basically, and saw that for some they are, uh, would, be, would have this expected orange thermal uh, distribution here. 
and for some they, some they really differ. And this difference you only can explain if you look at the phonon density of states in these materials, since every time you hit such resonances of phonons, you really have a, a different population ratio of your polaritons, telling you that these phonons really contribute to this light matter interaction in a way that they don't deface your uh, excitation. Now, all these experiments um, were done, of course, with uh, cavity setups that were built up in labs by PhD students. And now the project of Culebri, so the spin-off project, really tries to con convert these more or less complicated lab setups in the end into a device. So we want to make the step coming from quantum science to get to the quantum technology. Here you can see an example of our uh, room temperature absorption microscope where you really have two boxes, one with the cavity, one with all the electronics, and that this you can plug to your computer. We have a fully working software interface and then do the measurement. So on the long term, it's really uh, the goal to have such a system also applicable to the rising fields of quantum technology ranging from networks to cryptography and computers and so on. But what do we do now? Actually, now um, we of course improve our uh, system. So we already have a pretty flexible system. We optimize the laser machining. Uh, so uh, meaning that uh, this concave depression here really has to match the uh, intracavity mode and we are currently optimizing this to a very high degree. We uh, can do customized coating. So if people tell us which central wavelength they want, which reflectivity, which bandwidth, we can supply them with uh, the mirrors or uh, fiber mirrors as well as sample mirrors. Uh, finesse values of up to 100,000 are possible. I already showed that we can change the mode volume uh, from one to 100 lambda cubed uh, during the experiment. We have a coarse movement implemented so you can scan your mirror on a millimeter scale and simultaneously you can XY scan your mirror. So uh, really this fast live imaging on a scale of several 10 by 10 microns. So it's more like 100 at room temperature and 10 for cryogenic uh, temperatures. And that's my next point. Now we have this flexible systems and normally if you have something like that and you then want to go to cryogenics, it's really hard. And th that's one of our goals. We want to have in the end a system that is operational at low temperatures with a high finesse. Currently we have built up a, or we build up a, a system inside a closed cycle cryostat um, where you have vibrations on this plate on the scale of nanometers where you have drift and so on. And just to, to give an impression, what is the, the uh, daily work or what is the effort there? So back in 2012, uh, the cavity setups built there with commercial components had a stability on the order of nanometers at room temperature, so with no cryostat. And now, uh, really uh, the last 10 years and also our work um, included a lot of thinking and testing low ni noise electronics mechanical stiffness decoupling damping flexible and fast locking techniques to come to a stability which actually is uh, sufficient to lock to cavities with these high finesse values so today we are at a stability level on the order of picometers so it's like uh, below one picometer at room temperature and for the cryo uh, version we currently are for sure below 10 picometers so there's really a lot of effort going in there now if you got interested into this work or you have an experiment in mind please feel free to contact us so we are always interested in collaboration and we currently have one setup up and running only for doing test measurements where people from other research groups supply us with samples. And with this, I would like to thank my team. So you can see the postdocs and master students of Culebri, as well as our scientific mentors. And I would like to thank you for your attention. 
Okay, uh, Michael, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, talk and description of the uh, experimental facilities and possibilities that that, uh, that you have at hand. Uh, so well, uh, we have actually time for for a couple of questions, but uh, while I'm waiting uh, that somebody would type the question, uh, I will use the opportunity to ask the question myself. Uh, you mentioned something about uh, silicon vacancies in uh, in diamonds, right? Yeah. Uh, so that uh, that of course very interesting for for for, for many reasons, but uh, uh, I, I must have missed it. Uh, uh, these vacancies said are they in the, in the bulk diamonds or in the non diamond? In the, in either case, I'm interested. Uh, where do uh, where did you get them? Do you produce it? The, the, uh, in your lab or? I mean, uh, I think these crystals, uh, okay, these crystals were nano diamonds, so really like okay. a few nano, tens of nanometers in size. And um, I think my colleague got it from a collaboration. Um, actually, and preparing them was the uh, next question, how we- yeah, well, well, if it's a nano diamonds, that uh, it's uh, even more interesting, for example, in my case, uh, but uh, where do you get those uh, nano diamonds with silicon vacancies? Vacancies and uh, uh, well, the yield that you have for zinc photon, if you are interested in zinc photon, uh, or, you know, single vacancy centers uh, in nano diamonds. So, um, I would need to look it up in the uh, okay. papers. But uh, I know that I think uh, we we got this. Um, Solution, I think it was, and drop casted yeah. it in the mirror and then measured it. So okay. um, there are really groups who, who focus on, on producing these nano diamonds. So still, okay. still we can see them. Okay, great. Now I can see there is a question from Andre uh, Scherer. Uh, what is the coupling efficiency from the fiber mode into the cavity mode? Um, the coupling efficiency from the fiber, uh, fiber into the cavity uh, currently is like, I think, one fifth of uh, the photons go inside, but you can tune this. So um, there are methods like splicing different, cavity, uh, different fibers together and, and shaping, your, your, um, uh, shaping your, your depression properly where you really can increase this coupling. Okay. Uh, well, we also actually came to the end of the time. So thank you, uh, Michael, again for an interesting talk. And uh, I would like to welcome uh, the last speaker of, uh, of the session, uh, Maya Kavoti from uh, National Research Council Institute of Optics. Is the talk uh, laser induced tuning of single molecule images, a scalable tool for quantum technologies? Thank you. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so, um, and sorry, can you correctly see the slides or you see also the participants? Because I see here. No, no we see correctly the slides. And uh, if you see participants, you can actually move them away. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's what everybody. Ah, okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, I work in uh, Florence with Costanza Toninelli. And uh, I will talk indeed about organic molecules uh, as quantum emitters. So you have heard uh, probably from the talk of Vahid from yesterday, that organic molecules can really be used as excellent quantum emitters. And today I will show to you uh, other two advantages that you probably don't know about uh, such organic sources. The first is that they are really suitable systems to be integrated into hybrid photonic structures. And the second one is uh, that we found, we found a way totally optical to tune their frequency just by tightly focusing a laser. Okay, just to remind you, the great advantage of organic molecules is their flexibility. And this is why they are extensively used for a variety of applications. There are several colors available, the emission spans from the visible to the near infrared, their properties can be functionalized, and the fabrication uh, is also fast and easy. We can obtain in more or less one hour really thousands of organ single organic molecules. 
And with the same flexibility, we can imagine to isolate an individual molecule, which is schematically a two-level system, and uh, to use it as a um, deterministic single photon source. So by using a pulsed laser, we can trigger the excitation of single photons uh, on demand. And this is a fundamental resource, as you have seen, uh, for uh, several applications in quantum photonics technologies. And uh, with this uh, picture, I want to show somehow the vision that we have with such organic molecules. So, um, you must know that we just uh, need a simple tip containing an organic um, molecular solution to deposit our molecules. So we can imagine uh, in a scalable way to deposit them onto integrated structures, uh, to use them as nonlinear elements uh, uh, for quantum algorithms, uh, to employ them as single photon sources for quantum key distribution experiments um, and as um, sensors at the nanoscale. So uh, this is the vision, the ultimate vision, uh, of course, but indeed uh, organic molecules, once within the family of polyaromatic hydrocarbons, once they are protected by a crystalline uh, host matrix, they turn to be really photostable systems, both at room and cryogenic temperature. They have uh, an almost unitary quantum yield. And uh, um, by looking at these uh, at the energetic level scheme, uh, there are of course uh, vibrational levels involved. Um, uh, sorry, I see that Bidovan, okay. Um, by the way, the, in, the transition we're interested in is the red transition in the scheme, which is the so-called zero-zero phonon line, and uh, um, which contains at cryogenic temperature half of the emission. So within this trans mm -hmm. trans uh, transition, the single photons are bright, they are Fourier limited, and this is a fundamental prerequisite uh, um, for uh, two and multi-photon interference processes, uh, which are at the base of uh, several quantum uh, algorithms. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, regarding the scalability issue, organic molecules are nominally all identical. So we, we, they are suitable systems to address also the challenge of multiple and indistinguishable emitters. And now I want to show more in detail uh, our system. So we work with the benzoterylene molecules in anthracene crystal. And I will talk uh, today about our nanostructured emitter. So we developed uh, a fabrication method to obtain a submicrometric crystals of anthracene with a controlled amount of DBT inside, down to the level of one single DBT fluorescent molecule in each nanocrystal. So you can imagine that we can now take the nanocrystal and put it where we want onto the photonic structure, so where the field mode is maximum, and this is exactly our goal. And here I show uh, the, funda the um, typical characterization measurements that we perform in our lab. So these uh, measurements are, are um, done on uh, bare nanocrystals on a reflective surface. We put them into the cryostat, we reach three Kelvin, and uh, we can describe but the zero zero from line transition that I mentioned with that tunable narrow band laser. And you can see that we obtain a line width of few tens of megahertz, uh, which actually means that we have almost no decoherence. And we can describe the saturation curve, so the photon flux as a function of the excitation power. And you can see on the left that at maximum we have 1.5 mega counts per second. Also, in a um, Henry Brown and Twist configuration, we can uh, um, achieve this anti punching dip. And I want to note that this is measured at the maximum photon rate, and we have only a few percents multi photon probability. By using an excitation power below saturation, we go down to 1%. Okay, but now, I mean, uh, how good are all these properties? So, to make you better understand it, I show this slide. So these properties are enough good to make us collaborate with the Meteorological Center in Germany, the PTB. And uh, what did we do? Essentially, they came uh, to our lab with their standard uh, instruments and they verified that our single molecule uh, fulfills their prerequisites regarding brightness, purity and narrow bandwidth of the emission. Uh, and we could use our single molecule as a reference standard for low flux intensities. So we use the emission as a constant adjustable flux to calibrate a single photon detector against an analog photodiode. 
And you can see here the calibration, which is uh, done in a quite broad range of photon rate. And uh, um, and indeed, this is actually a good, a very important result for us because it demonstrates that uh, our quantum emitter can be used for really practical application. This uh, experiment is performed in continuous mode operation, continuous wave, uh, wave excitation mode, I mean. Um, but passing to pulse excitation uh, operation, uh, actually, it would also turn to be advantages compared to standard techniques based on attenuated laser. Okay, so talking about uh, pulse excitation, actually, this is, uh, I mean, the fundamental operation mode to go uh, to in order to have a trigger excitation, so to uh, go towards on-demand single photon emission. And actually, I show here just briefly the, the very recent results we obtained, just submitted and uh, published on archive of our Hangu Mandel experiment. Uh, performed with a pulse uh, excitation uh, operation mode. This was the first time for us to use a uh, pulse laser. And you can see um, this the scheme of the setup on the top. So we used uh, single photons from a, a single individual molecule isolated in a nanocrystal. We took the emission. Um, we coupled into a fiber setup. We divided the stream of the, the streams of single photons in two paths and made them interfere in a fiber beam splitter. By means of fiber polarization controls, we could uh, set the two streams as indistinguishable or distinguishable. And you can see the result uh, on the bottom. So red for parallel polarization of the two streams and blue for orthogonal. And uh, um, so we could uh, actually, oops. I don't know why, sort of have some issues with the, I cannot see my pointer and do you, I, do you also see a window with the participants? I cannot take away, sorry. Yeah, well, as I said, in principle, you can move window of, uh, with the participants to the side or you can minimize it. Uh, now it should be okay, sorry. Yeah, I had some issues before. Okay, so just, to, sorry, just for the interruption, just to continue, um, we uh, developed a full model to describe our data. So which include uh, also the imperfections of the setup. So the like also non-perfect indistinguishable uh, emission and filtering. And uh, we could extrapolate a visibility uh, of eight, about 80%. So we did this in particular by considering the area of the central peak uh, in the two polarization cases. And we could, uh, thanks to our model, and you can see the, the good agreement of the model with the data here in this plot where I show only the parallel polarization case. You can see the good agreement with the fit uh, within the zoom. And um, we could extrapolate the contribution of residual dephasing and we um, attributed it mainly to a temperature issue. Indeed, our cryostat is limited to three Kelvin while actually uh, our molecules are really lifetime limited only at 1.5 Kelvin. And we uh, could evaluate a value of 96% uh, visibility, which is at the limit for the limit of no dephasing. Okay, so uh, actually the details of this work were in Murtaza's poster. Unfortunately, it was yesterday, so I couldn't announce it. I hope you have seen it or that is still available somehow. Um, just to conclude the view of this experiment, actually the results were pro promising, but if we look at the collection efficiency, so the count rates that we had at the first lens, these were only a few percent. So why and how to solve this? Well, this is uh, due to the fact that we use here uh, the bare source, so just nanocrystals without any nanophotonics. And um, we hence have to go towards uh, integration onto, into photonic structures. But actually how to do it with organic molecules? This is totally not trivial. There are several ways, but we tried uh, to go for an alternative platform. So we wanted really to uh, exploit the flexibility of such nanocrystal sources. And we imagined that if we could disperse them into a polymer material, which is also a very flexible uh, platform, we could straight away uh, obtain a totally polymer integrated photonic structure. And we could achieve this with this direct laser writing technique 
um, which consists just in a tightly focused pulsed laser into an initially liquid photoresist. And at the focus, the material um, is induced to have a two photon absorption process, which solidifies the material within the focus. And we can imagine by scanning the laser focus to obtain any 3D, um, any 3D nanostructure with a resolution below the diffraction limit down to 150 nanometers, with a method which is fast and inexpensive, and most importantly, which enables 3D writing. And this is what we uh, realized. Um, a photonic platform with the basic light collecting elements. Each of the element is uh, written around a single nanocrystal. And you can see here a microgem lens which redirects the fluorescence uh, towards narrow angles to maximize collection within the objective. And a suspended waveguide which uh, uh, routes the fluorescence from the crystal which is integrated on the top towards convenient output modes. And here uh, I showed experimental results. You can see the SEM images of the final integrated structures and the corresponding fluorescence maps, uh, which uh, are the first good results since they show the persistence of fluorescence even after this fabrication. I want to note here that we could perform a preliminary selection of the best emitting nanocrystals. So we maximized the success probability of the final structures. And you can see here the characterization at cryogenic temperature with a very high single photon purity, an almost lifetime limited limit, and a very good photostability over one and a half hours. So now you may wonder uh, how this structure, this platform helped us to, uh, for, um, to collect photons from the cryostat. Well, here you can compare the saturation curve of the bare nanocrystals and the integrated platform. And by looking at the maximum count rate, you can see that we can reach uh, 12 times enhancement with two and a half mega counts per second, which is the value not corrected by any means. We evaluated a 40% collection efficiency. And if you wonder how good is the output mode, well, it's enough, what well, is enough good to um, have a more than 50% coupling efficiency to a single mode fiber. So indeed, these results showed that direct laser writing is an effective technique uh, to, um, to, to allow for enhanced collection efficiency and to realize a 3D also complex and integrated structures. And uh, now I will talk about the last topic, which is, uh, let's say, about the vision of scaling up to many emitters. So what are the possibilities in our case? And uh, here, the first uh, issue is how to uh, tune the different emitters, since organic molecules, because of the interaction with the matrix, have slightly different emission frequency. So the standard um, way to do it is using electrodes and doing star tuning, but electrodes, electrodes are actually macroscopic compared to the single molecules, so you can hardly perform individual tuning. Well, we found an alternative way, and we did these results together with the University of Leiden, the group of Michel Ory, and the uh, Polish Academy of Sciences. So almost by chance, we uh, observed a very weird effect that is uh, just by focusing a high power pump laser onto a single molecule, we could shift in a controlled way the zero zero phonon line. And uh, actually, this is indeed a totally optical, fabrication-free, micro-result way to perform independent tuning. The physics below this, uh, underneath this phenomenon is just that um, the laser induces a photoionization cascade, so long-lived charged states, which uh, build up a local electric field, uh, which induces a Stark effect, which is a local Stark effect. It's not an AC Stark effect, because actually after the pump laser is switched off, this shift persists for several hours. And here I show such results uh, more in detail. So we performed the experiment in, on different substrates, so gold, glass, and different systems. Our nanocrystals on the left here, and uh, in Leiden they use DBT, but in a uh, the bromion naphthalene matrix of uh, macroscopic crystals. And here I show the time map of the shift that we can perform by switching on the pump laser. On the x-axis, you can see 
the frequency the tuning and on the y axis the measurement the experiment time and these dark spots correspond to the peak of the zero phonon line transition which is shifted in a controlled way so while we could we can perform this shift only towards red uh, wavelengths. Um, you can see that on the right, they could perform shifts towards both directions. And this is uh, compatible to the Stark effect, which is quadratic in our uh, system and linear in their system. So also by looking at the line widths during this process, the coherence properties are preserved since they're still almost lifetime limited. And uh, so this excludes indeed any heating induced process. And if you wonder how, uh, what is the resolution, the spatial resolution of this technique, here is your result where we try indeed to uh, shift only uh, the, the transition of one molecule, the one contained in the blue labeled nanocrystal, where, which uh, has several nanocrystal nearby, as you can see in the space map below. And indeed, here you can see that the, the shift is only applied to the blue uh, dots, while the other are unchanged. And here you have the shift in frequency on the y axis and the uh, pump power on the x axis. So we could, uh, we can achieve a resolution below 15 micrometer in this case, but actually is only limited by the laser beam size. And uh, um, okay, here I just show how my last result. Um, I, we used this technique to put into resonance five different individual emitters, tuning independently each of them. They are contained in five different nanocrystals. You see them on the spatial map on the right. And on the left, you can compare the initial line width before the shifting process in dashed line, more than 20 gigahertz apart, and the final line widths in solid lines which are put together uh, within two line widths. And uh, just to make it clear, here I will show two videos, one before and the other after the tuning process. So along with the video time, you have to mention that we are tuning a narrowband laser. Here you saw that the molecules uh, lighted up all uh, in different uh, frequency positions. And uh, here, after the shifting process, they light, light up all together, all five together within two line widths. So we are still uh, working, of course, to optimize this uh, method, but in, it's promising to go towards arrays of multiple and indistinguishable meters. Also, by combining this technique with the 3D laser technique for integration that I showed to you. And uh, with these. Uh, I conclude, I've shown to you that uh, uh, our molecules can be used as reliable single photon sources. They can also be used uh, to calibrate uh, a single photon detector. So as a reference standard for low flux intensities, I showed our method for three, performing 3D integration, which is compatible with the meter coherence properties and which uh, really enables for uh, um, a collection of efficiency enhancement. And uh, really with this uh, last laser induced technique, all optical, we can uh, address our, one of our next goals, which is working with multiple emitters, but also we want to work with um, more complex on-chip operations and also to use our, our molecules for QKD experiments, but with true photons. And I want to thank all the groups, so Costanza Toninelli, Francesco, Marco, Pietro Lombardi, also the uh, new students, Murtaza, Prosengit and Rocco and all the collaborators. And uh, thank you for the attention. Thank you, Maya. Very interesting talk and uh, well, uh, exciting technique for tuning properties of uh, individual emitters. I'm, uh, well, I'm, uh, uh, waiting for the yeah for the questions. Okay, well there is a question from Ale Alexandra Gonzalez to uh, Super nice talk. How does this sources compare with the quantum dot ones? For example, like the ones presented by Senior Lars on Monday. What are the main advantages of your sources with respect to these ones? Okay, so yes, uh, so one of the, um, okay, uh, compared to the state of the art, actually the, the results that I showed for the 3D integrated uh, molecules are uh, somehow, um, I mean, that complete set of characterization of cryogenic temperature was never 
shown in literature for uh, other 3D integrated systems in the sense that they don't preserve uh, the uh, Fourier limited line width. While in this sense, uh, molecules are, I mean, we realize that they are flexible systems. And uh, the other great advantage, advantage is really practical in the sense that we can really uh, fabricate samples with thousands of emitters in uh, one hour. Uh, all the fabrication that I've shown uh, with the 3D integration uh, was performed all in all in less in half a day. And uh, uh, I mean, in this sense, uh, we can really address uh, uh, the issue of scalability, scalability in the sense of scalability of, this, of the emitter itself. And uh, I think that this uh, laser-induced technique is uh, also a big step in the sense that, I mean, this is really the next work we are working on. We can imagine to easily somehow independently tune each emitter on our chip. And this, I think, is somehow special. And also, just to say a last, okay, I don't know if there are other questions. Maybe I can. Uh... Yeah, well, uh, there are other questions. So from uh, Andrea Scherer, uh, do you have control in which directions the molecules are tuned? In the tuning plot of DBT, DBN, some molecules are tuned to the lower, some to higher frequency. Yeah. Um, so um, actually, uh, so that experiment was not performed by us, but by the group of Michel Ori in Leiden. And uh, in that experiment, they didn't have control in the sense that somehow while we are, were exciting the single nanocrystal with a single molecule with a focused laser, they were exciting somehow the whole sample, uh, no, not the whole sample, but a big region in wide field configuration. And uh, uh, they were characterizing this general uh, behavior because we wanted somehow to, to have some confirmation that we could attribute this effect to a stark effect. Uh, they haven't studied the effect on the single at the single molecule level. I can tell you that uh, uh, with our experience on nanocrystals uh, of anthracene, we can uh, anyway control uh, many parameters of the shift because we uh, there is a um, almost a linear dependent uh, dependence uh, with the pump uh, laser power and uh, um, and I mean, uh, uh, we can really, this is the control, the level of control is also demonstrated by the uh, resonance uh, of the five different emitters. So uh, also um, including a feedback uh, control into the experiment, you can really think of uh, keeping the emitters there without any oscillation. So in this sense, we hope to really uh, optimize the method. Okay. So uh, the last question, uh, well, it's again from Alessandra. Uh, uh, if uh, can you think of integrating your emitters with nanophotonic structures like photonic crystals? Yeah, we are actually um, working on that. <laughs> now we are really working on integrating our emitters somehow everywhere and. Um, yeah, I mean, as always, there are practical issues, but uh, yeah, there are several fabrication uh, methods, uh, not only nanocrystals, but uh, uh, I mean, many ways really, but nanocrystals, I think they're the most promising and we can really think of position them where we want. So I would say yes. Thank you. Uh, okay, I can't help it. Uh, I'd like to ask the, the question about this uh, wonderful tuning technique. Uh, did you control the polarization uh, of the emitted photons? I mean, I presume the, the, the photons that are emitted they are linearly polarized, but when yeah. you tune them, uh, is there any change in the, the orientation of this linear polarization or, or, or something like that? Did you control that? Um... We didn't control this, but uh, uh, somehow I can I can tell you that probably there is no change because of course we have uh, maximized the emission when we tune our linear polarized laser to uh, the excitation laser, which is different from the pump laser that we use to shift. Mm -hmm. um, we have to tune it to have uh, the, to maximize the excitation and more or less the excitation the emission is stable during this process. So uh, from this I could extrapolate that the polarization stays there. Thank you. Sergey, you are mute. Yeah, I think. 
sorry. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much, Maya, and thank uh, thanks all speakers uh, of this session. And with, this, with this, we are going for the break of 15 minutes. We start again a quarter past uh, five. Okay, thank you, Lukas, uh, and thank you, thanks to the organizers for uh, organizing this wonderful meeting um, and, and the invitation. So um, I'm going to uh, tell you about some recent experiments that, that we've been doing uh, in uh, TMD materials, in atomic bit, in semiconductors, which uses optics to, uh, to uh, basically explore strong correlations between electrons. So the key people in, in this work are uh, high, uh, underlined here, postdocs and students in my group, Tomasz uh, Smolensky, uh, Clemens Kulenkamp, Ankur uh, Tureja, and Puneet Murthy. And, and we have a number of um, experimental and, and uh, theoreticians involved. So uh, we already heard about uh, 2D materials, but let me, uh, since it wasn't the main topic of, of any of the talks uh, so far, let me say a few words about them. So basically, uh, we are talking about uh, atomic latin materials that are can have very different electronic, optical, or magnetic properties. And what is really nice about uh, the, the 2D materials is that different layers uh, uh, bind to each other with weak Van der Waals forces, which means that, that one can exfoliate uh, uh, monolayers and then recombine them or combine different, com uh, put together different combinations of those. So uh, in a sense, you have certain building blocks, which could be insulators, uh, graphene, like uh, semi-metal, or semiconductors, et cetera. And then the idea is that by bringing these materials together without having to worry about uh, issues that, that come up in uh, usual, for example, uh, molecular beam epitaxy growth in terms of uh, lattice mismatch, without having to worry about that, we can combine uh, the materials. So what is nice in these material system, again, as compared to uh, standard uh, semiconductors, is that the dielectric screening is substantially reduced. We can control the charge density using gates, as I will try to show, and then the carrier masses are, are heavy. And these all imply uh, that we can have strong interactions, and then we can actually tune the ratio of interactions to the kin uh, characteristic kinetic energy scale. So in principle, we can have this ratio exceed 30 or 40 in these materials. At the same time, the reduced dielectric screening and heavy carrier mass means that, that the excitons, the, uh, the polarization waves that, that we generate in the material will be very strongly bound uh, with four radius on the order of one nanometer, which in turn implies that their optical response will be very strong. And uh, so advantages doesn't end here, actually it only starts. So as was beautifully demonstrated, um, proposed about 10 years ago by uh, Alan McDonald and demonstrated first by Pablo Jarillo Herrero, that one can actually introduce a twist angle when putting together the monolayers together. And that opens up a whole new realm of, of interesting physics. Uh, owing to the formation of super lattices and flat bands. And I want to emphasize here is that, that we're really talking about uh, with the advances in the system, uh, it, a really new research field, uh, which falls somewhere in between sort of quantum materials and quantum simulations. So one can call this a synthetic quantum matter with interesting and tunable properties for uh, correlated states of electrons or even for simple photonics. Okay, so uh, I will just show you in terms, since I mentioned the, the beautiful uh, or the new aspects of this, I'll just briefly sketch these beautiful experiments on twisted bilayer graphene system, where basically several groups uh, uh, observed as they change the carrier, uh, carrier density go from uh, neutrality to electron doping or back to uh, hole doping, uh, they were able to see these uh, intertwined uh, superconducting states that are separated by mode like correlated insulator states. And later on, it was also uh, observed that, that these correlated insulator states are actually exhibiting qu quantum anomalous hole effects. So they have finite churn number um, uh, 
uh, one, two, or three, depending on, on the, uh, the feeling factor one is looking at. Okay, and uh, so basically this is uh, an experiment from the Maifetov's lab in ICFO, but, uh, uh, but what I would like to emphasize here is that, that uh, similar physics can also be observed in optically active bilayer 2D semiconductors where one can actually prove this physics using, um, using optical excitations. So, um, so it is the outline of my talk. Actually, uh, I will come back to this at the very end, the twisted by this if I have time. But the main uh, emphasis of the talk would be to first introduce to you uh, the elementary optical excitations in, uh, in uh, direct bang up 2D semiconductors. So in our case, these are transition metal dichalcogenite monolayers. Um, and then I'll uh, show you two experiments. The first one is really a photonics experiment uh, where I will try to show you that, that we, we uh, can, um, or we have uh, managed to uh, obtain quantum confinement of excitons uh, into a 1D uh, system using a monolayer PIN junction where the PN end doping is uh, essentially achieved by uh, using top and bottom gates. Okay, and then in the uh, second experiment that I'm going to tell you about is uh, the observation of charge order in a monolayer Wigner crystal. And a connection to optics here is that, that we have heard about photonic crystals. So basically, uh, the way we observe Wigner crystal is that, that the Wigner crystal creates a crystal, a polarization crystal, if you will, uh, 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 for the optical excitations, and it is uh, the uh, the new band structure and the uh, umklap resonances that arise that allowed us to observe the Wigner crystal states. Okay, so uh, very briefly, the two D uh, semiconductors, as I said, uh, the the choice for us are are mo uh, molybdenum diselenide. So when I talk about a monolayer, this is actually uh, three layers, uh, uh, the, uh, a, mo a, a triangular lattice of molybdenum sandwiched in between uh, two selenite layers. If we just look at this uh, the, uh, mon uh, sort of tri-layer from a distance, we see that, that it actually has a honeycomb lattice structure with A sites, say, occupied by molybdenum atoms and the B sites are occupied by two selenium atoms. Okay, the, uh, owing to the band structure, the interesting physics takes place in the high symmetry K and K prime points of the Brillouin zone. And basically for what concerns us here is that, that this is a direct band gap semiconductor with this additional value degree of freedom, which basically sets the polarization rule. So, so basically, we, just like in gallium arsenide, we have direct band gap transitions. Uh, it's just that if you're dealing with, say, with uh, K prime or minus K value, all optical transitions would be uh, sigma plus, and uh, the opposite is true for the K value. And if you look, uh, were to sketch the absorption spectrum of this material, and I'll show you experiments naturally, then you would expect to see that this would be dominated by an exciton peak uh, and plus additional Rydberg excitons before the continuum sets in. And the exciton peak is very strong owing uh, to, the, uh, to the, uh, uh, the enhancement of Coulomb interactions in the system, which may ensures that, that uh, the electron that, that we excite from the valence band to the conduction band remains strongly correlated with the hole that it leaves behind in the valence band. Okay, so that in turn enhances the oscillator strength. So uh, one other term that I would like to introduce in addition to this bound state of an electron and hole is that of a trion, which actually shows up in say in a photoluminescence experiment uh, as the lowest energy uh, emission uh, line in, in, the, uh, in the spectrum. So the understanding of the trion is that uh, the, in the pre uh, presence of electrons, one of the electrons can actually bind to an exciton to lower the energy of the system. So this is uh, the uh, counterpart of the H minus uh, molecule. And in this case, the binding energy is about 25 milli electron volts, which is a sizable energy that, that allows us to study uh, this object and its collective excitation separately. Okay, so that's the, um, 
the very basics of of, uh, of TMDs. So uh, uh, the structures that we deal with are charge tunable structures. So these are the simplest fun van der Waals structures you can imagine. We're go going to have a top and a bottom gate uh, to which we can apply voltages independently. We also have a contact to this uh, purple layer, which is the 2D semiconductor in which we generate electron hole pairs. And we can actually have both uh, two contacts to this layer uh, if, uh, if you want to apply a source and drain uh, or a source drain voltage. So what happens is that, that if you focus on this uh, left plot, so this shows the source drain current that we drive through the system. And we see that as a uh, function of the back gate voltage, there is a region in which basically there is no current flowing. And this is the, the charge neutrality at this, uh, for this voltage range, we do not have any carriers in the system. Therefore, the resistivity is very high. As we inject the electrons, we see that, that the, uh, the current turns on. And as we inject holes, similarly, we have a whole current. Now, we can do the optical spectroscopy of this device, exactly the same device under the same conditions. And we see that when the system is charge neutral, we have a strong exit online. So this is a color coded plot, but I will, uh, again, I, I can think about uh, line cuts through this, which will basically uh, show uh, enhanced uh, reflection uh, through this uh, in the system. Okay, so I'll show this uh, shortly. Now, if I uh, consider the regime where I inject electrons, for example, I see that, that the exciton line uh, starts to blue shift uh, strongly, loses its oscillator strength and transfers it to a new uh, red shifted resonance. And this is uh, what we have termed the attractive polarum. Okay, so the attractive polarum, so this is yet another device uh, uh, tilted over. Again, the important point here, I show you the line cut. So if I take a line cut here in the charge neutrality regime, I see the exciton line. This can be a very nice narrow resonance that whose line width can be up to 90% determined by its radiative decay rate. And if I inject electrons, I have a narrower resonance with smaller oscillator strength, and this is the attractive uh, polaron resonance. Now, at very low densities, the attractive polaron resonance goes to a trion, and we can think of the attractive polaron as a collective excitation of many trions. Okay, but this is, again, uh, not so important because for this uh, talk, my focus would be on the, uh, the repulsive polaron, so the, how the exciton energy uh, se uh, is sensitive uh, to the presence of electrons and holes and exhibits this abrupt blue shift, okay? So this abrupt blue shift tells us that, that uh, uh, there are exciton electron interactions in the system and the excitons are sensitive uh, to the presence of electrons. And as we will see, not just to the presence, but also the state of the electrons makes a difference in how uh, these resonances appear in the system. So we can think of, therefore, these optical excitations as a non-destructive measurement of the electronic downstream. Okay, so um, now I'd like to show you the first experiment where uh, we, uh, about quantum confinement. So for this case, we uh, worked uh, uh, with a rather complicated device so again, the heterostructure is simple, uh, just like I have see, uh, shown you before, but we have many gates because our initial intention, which still is the case, to be able to study transport as it is modified by optical excitations. So basically in this device, we have source and drain contacts as well as the site voltage probes. And basically in addition to a global back gate, we have a top gate with the constriction. So this top gate is about 200 nanometers wide and 100 nanometers uh, in separation, okay? So, and we can apply independently voltage to the top gate as well as the back gate. So a simple transport experiment that one can do is that, that one can inject electrons through the back gate and then uh, change the top gate voltage in order to close off uh, this, uh, this channel. So when the cha uh, top gate voltage is uh, zero, for example, the channel is open, the electrons uh, can flow through, and then we have a finite source strain current. Now, as we uh, sort of decrease the top gate voltage, we make it 
uh, more difficult for electrons to flow through, and eventually we can uh, pinch it off, meaning that, that we have depleted the electrons out of this, this region. Okay, so that's important uh, for us because we will uh, try to actually not only deplete the electrons, but try, uh, we'll hold up the region under the top here. So I'll come to this, but before I do that, I want to show you the reflectance spectrum at uh, zero top gate voltage. Again, this is not the nicest sample we have. So in this case, we uh, use the contrast to denote the changes in the reflectivity. This is the exciton resonance, and this is the repulsive polarum as we dope electrons into the system. Okay, so now what I will do is I will fix the back gate uh, at, uh, at five volts, which means that the whole device is flooded with electrons. So we have a sizable electron density on the order of 10 to the 12 uh, electrons per centimeter squared or so. Okay, so now uh, what happens if we start to decrease the top gate voltage? Okay, so uh, basically for these electrons, as we reduce the top gate uh, voltage, what, what really counts if you consider this as a capacitor is the sum of the top and the bottom gate uh, voltages. So if this total value is low enough, then the lowest energy configuration of the system is hold doping under the top gate, okay? So we would expect then for very negative top gate voltages that we're, even though the system is globally electron doped under the top gate, we're going to have hold doping, okay? And necessarily, again, this is an equilibrium system. So uh, we have a well-defined Fermi energy. And the, uh, so you can think of this now as the P-doped region and N-doped region. And, uh, and it separated the two regions would be an undoped uh, neutral region, okay? And basically you can see from just my sketch that, that in this neutral region, actually we have a in-plane electric field um, uh, that, that basically is necessary to set the band offset, okay? So the electric field, if you were to plot it in this uh, blue curve, it's zero whenever we have charges because it will be completely screened. But in this neutral region, we're going to have relatively large electric fields that, that are on the order of uh, 0 0.1 uh, volts per nanometer, okay? So now what does that mean? Well, the excitons are tightly bound, but they're polarizable objects. And if we apply an electric field, just like we have heard in earlier uh, yesterday in the talks about trapping levitated particles, the finite polarizability of the excitons means that in the presence of, of the, this electric field, we will be, uh, they will be subject to a uh, DC Stark effect. And this lowers their energy, which means that there will be a trapping potential uh, for excitons whenever there is uh, a, a large in-plane electric field, okay? So therefore the excitons will be, uh, will, can lower their energy if they live in this region that separates the PN and doped regions, okay? And keep in mind that actually it's not just uh, the, uh, the DC electric field that, that confines them. I have shown you before that if I go to n doped region, then the energy of the exciton uh, or the repulsive polarum is, is enhanced, okay? So therefore, and the same applies for the whole side. So which tells us that, that basically if this exciton in this uh, uh, neutral region, if it were to venture into the electron or hold up region, it will see an additional interaction induced uh, potential barrier. This actually is already very interesting physics in itself because this potential is, has a finite dissipative part because of the fact that that, um, uh, that repulsive polarons can relax into, the, into an attractive polaron. So, uh, but the main, the bottom line is that, that the excitons will be confined in the region where uh, they, there are no charge carriers. And this is my sketch of, of the device. So this is the, um, the top gate, the two sides of the top gate, Underneath, we have hole doping, uh, thanks to the very uh, negative voltage we applied. And then we have these one dimensional regions where the excitons are going to be trapped ac according to my arguments. Um, and uh, so we will either have uh, 1D wires along the top gate or along the edge direction in this case. 
Okay, so let's see how uh, whether this really happens. So again, I set the back gate at uh, plus five volts, and here what I show you is how the spectrum changes in and around uh, this uh, the the top gate as I lower, uh, lower the top gate voltage. So you can see that everything is normalized to uh, the spectra at five volts. You can see that that the um, in, in, uh, under the top gate, first we reduce the electron density, which means that the exciton now starts to redshift, becomes eventually a neutral exciton when we deplete out the electrons from the top gate. Okay, and then we can actually, uh, by decreasing it further, we can hold off, and then the exciton energy once again starts to blue shift. But there is more to it. You can see that that there are these discrete lines that basically uh, sort of separate out from the exciton, lowering the energy by a few milli electron volts, okay? And we can actually check that, that this is not some artifact, some interference effect by looking at the photoluminescence, and in which case we excite with the high energy laser, and again, look at the, uh, the top gate voltage dependence of photoluminescence, and you can see that we, here we have the exciton luminescence, which then, uh, the luminescence becomes dominated by the lowest energy states. In this case, again, these red shifting uh, 1D uh, excitonic channels. Okay, so the proof that, that these are uh, 1D is provided by looking at their polarization properties. And as many uh, uh, of you uh, know, or probably know, that, that if you have a 1D emitter, if the confinement is smaller than the, uh, than the wavelength, then the emission uh, of, of these uh, 1D channels would be predominantly polarized along the axis, uh, along the free axis, okay? So that is due to the, or can be understood as being arising from the electron hole exchange interaction, the long range electron hole exchange interaction. So indeed, if you look at then a region with, uh, that is away from this gap, what we see is that that all these discrete lines that, that we see are strictly linearly polarized. I don't know why my cursor is so slow. Maybe I'll switch to uh, an arrow. Um, so, um, uh, pen, yeah. So basically uh, these are the discrete lines and the, uh, the polarization here is parallel to uh, the wire axis. Sorry, that was too fast. Now, if you go to um, uh, this gap region, then we see that we have two classes of, of emission lines with orthogonal polarization, the weaker ones corresponding to these short wires uh, that, um, that are formed along the, uh, the axis perpendicular to the, uh, to the wire. Okay, so, um, so this is very nice. And, and uh, so one, the excitons in by themselves could be very interesting because of the, the fact that combined with the fact that they have a finite dipole moment, remember that, that they are confined uh, due to an electric field, which makes them dipolar, okay? And these 1D dipolar excitons will interact much more strongly than their 2D counterparts, okay? So, so therefore we think that already in the system, uh, we have a chance of seeing uh, sort of polariton or exciton blockade effect where we could uh, really uh, enhance the interactions uh, enough that, that, that uh, we can excite one exciton at a time, at least in, in, uh, for these guys, uh, for these 200 nanometer long wires. But we do not have to stop there. We can change the geometry make, let's say, instead of such a flat uh, uh, sort of intersection, we can make a bow tie geometry and then have a zero D uh, exciton confinement. And then really in this case have zero D excitons, quantum dots uh, that we can fully electrically uh, tune and, and control. Uh, in the 1D case, we can also think about coupling them to, uh, to cavities. Thanks to the large bow radius, very small bow radius, we have a very large uh, cavity exciton coupling, which means that even if you go from 2D to 1D, we should be able to see a few media electron volt normal mode splitting. And these exciton lines are much narrower, which means that we have an excellent chance of seeing uh, a strong coupling or reaching the strong coupling, which again is important in this case only for 
sort of studying strong interacting photons. Okay, with the little time I have remaining, I just want to switch to the last topic. So I showed you these beautiful experiments or mentioned briefly uh, the experiments where strong correlation effects were observed uh, by introducing uh, flat bands in, in, uh, through the more in, in more super lattices. So one question is whether this is absolutely necessary to uh, see uh, strong correlations. And the answer is actually no. Uh, so basically, what is really important is that that the, is the comparison between the kinetic energy of of, this, uh, of the electrons uh, and the average Coulomb repulsion between them. So uh, if you look at the ratio of these two quantities, which is called the RS parameter, I already introduced this. So this scales uh, linearly with the effective mass. This is good. Uh, inversely with the dielectric constant. This is also good for the TMD materials. And then with one over the square root of the electron density. And this is kind of the difficult part because in principle, one can reduce the electron density arbitrarily and ensure that, that this RS parameter is large, but there is a limit that is uh, set by the disorder uh, the, um, and, and basically uh, sort of the strong correlations will can be hindered by, uh, by the um, disorder effects. Okay, so now if RS is small, what we have is a Fermi liquid. And then basically uh, the discussions that I, I didn't go into the theory, but the understanding of these exciton polaron lines is basically uh, rather straightforward in this limit. And in this case, electrons form a liquid, there is no uh, real uh, long range uh, correlations, even though there are, of course, some short range correlations between electrons. Now, if we were to have a knob to increase the RS value, for example, by lowering the electron density, then it was predicted about 85 years ago that actually electrons would spontaneously crystallize uh, and form a so called Wigner crystal, which, of course, was predicted by Eugene Wigner himself. Okay, so this is a spectacular effect of, of basically uh, strong correlations where the trans, uh, continuous translation symmetry can be broken uh, by interactions. Okay, so um, now let's see uh, uh, sort of how we can uh, see this, uh, the, the formation of a Wigner crystal. So I'll take you back to, uh, let's say my excitons, but now I'm going to introduce you uh, the actual exciton dispersion. So normally I'm only interested in very small momentum of excitons, right? This is the light cone. Excitons are, uh, have a parabolic dispersion, at least the transverse excitons, and uh, their mass is about equal to the free electron mass. So uh, most of these excitonic states are actually uh, dark. They cannot be K-radiated. We, we only see the ones uh, around k equals zero. There is actually a two exciton branches, the transverse and longitudinal, but given the time, maybe I should not dwell too much into this, but basically we see the exciton line that, that is doubly degenerate uh, at, at k equals zero. Uh, these actually longitudinal and transverse branches uh, correspond to the two valleys or, or reduce to the, two, uh, the excitons in two valleys. Now, if I dope the system and if I have an electron liquid, a Fermi liquid, then what happens is that the dispersion hardly gets modified. There is the, a small change in the effective mass. But the main thing is this blue shift uh, that I have shown you before uh, that I celebrated saying that, that this is basically a sensitive measure of the electrons uh, in the system. Okay. Now, what is really interesting, though, is that, that if now the electrons form a Wigner crystal, uh, then basically our excitons interact with the electrons. That's why they see this energy shift. So there's an effective repulsive interaction between the excitons and electrons. And once the electrons are form a lattice, this is like a crystal for the excitons for the polarization waves in the system. So we really have to consider the excitonic dispersion within this mini or reduced Brillouin zone where uh, we now are going to have these umklop resonances, that is the, uh, the excitons at, at the uh, reciprocal lattice momentum would be projected back to k equals zero. And they can then hybridize with the k equals zero excitons and develop a finite oscillator strain. Okay, so this is what I meant by the photonic crystal analogy. So 
Therefore, if we can look for such resonances and whenever we see them, we would know that, that uh, the electrons have formed a crystalline structure for the excitons because otherwise there is no reason why excitons to see, um, uh, to see a crystalline structure. Okay, so uh, since time is really up, uh, so I will uh, skip the, uh, the detailed band structure. So this we can calculate uh, by assuming a Hartree shift uh, for, uh, between exciton and electron. So maybe I'll just show you anyway, since I, this somehow this is very slow. So uh, anyway, but what I wanted to mention here is that these are the exciton branches that, that we normally study. And, um, and then uh, there is now uh, the Umklap resonances two of which are also bright, okay? Barely so, but, but they are bright. So, um, uh, so this is another device, exciton becoming repulsive polaron and attractive polaron. We look at this low density region, and indeed what we see is that, that if, when we differentiate the data, the, uh, the repulsive polaron, in addition to the repulsive polaron, there is a weak resonance that shifts more strongly with the electron density than the exciton itself, okay? And if we fit the, uh, this energy difference between these two resonances, we find exactly what we would expect from a triangular lattice uh, if we include the exciton mass. So this signature, as we increase temperature, this is four Kelvin, it's already weaker. If you go to higher temperatures, already at uh, 10 Kelvin, it's barely there, and above 11 Kelvin, it's completely disappeared. So what is happening is that as we increase temperature, thermal fluctuations are melting uh, the exciton, uh, the Umkla presence, or the Wigner crystal, and therefore the Umkla presence disappears. And uh, so if you apply a magnetic field, the, the resonances become stronger, uh, as you can see at, at 6 Tesla, and um, so I will not dwell into uh, sort of how uh, this actually these resonances tell us about the um, uh, about the the excitonic origin or high momentum excitonic origin of these resonances because of the lack of uh, Zeeman splitting of the Umkrat resonances. So this I will have to skip. Now by going to high magnetic fields, we can actually bring uh, shift one of the k equals zero resonances so high in energy that we can bring the Umklap into resonance with it. Then at that point, we can really see a strong resonance. And this we have used to study uh, the, the, um, um, the contribution or, or, or of the uh, disorder in the system. So basically we, what we find is that that disorder indeed leads to a broadening, uh, but we can put a lower bound on how large our Wigner crystallites are that, that the correlation length is larger than five uh, lattice constants. And that we obtain by fitting uh, to, uh, our theoretical model into this, um, uh, this Umklap resonance. Okay, so um, this is what happens in twisted by there. So I will not go into that. So I'll just uh, stop here and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Attach, for a very interesting talk. Um, I wasn't aware that this exists, this Wigner crystal in the solid state. So this is very educational. Um, I, I have a question actually um, re related to this experiment where you had your, this, this top gate with the slit inside. Uh, you explained that there is this neutral region where the excitons are formed and you looked at the PL. And then mm -hmm. you also said that it is, it is actually emitted along the edge. Now, I, I wonder whether this emission pattern is influenced by the electrode itself, because the excitons will have their image you know, in, inside these electrodes, and that ultimately generates some interference effects, I would expect. Yeah. So we were actually also worried about that, that whether uh, the presence of the metallic gate uh, could influence uh, uh, the emission properties of, of the excitons. Um, but we, this we can check by basically uh, sort of um, uh, setting the top gate voltage equal to zero, such that, that basically we have a uniform uh, electron density or, or neutral uh, sample. And, and we did not see any effect of, of the top gate. 
And this is probably due to the fact that this is a really teeny tiny top gate. I believe it's like uh, seven nanometers uh, thick gold. So it does not, I mean, it's, it's basically uh, mostly transparent and I'm trying to see if I have the number here. So uh, yeah, it's seven nanometer uh, gold gate. So it looks like it's, its effect is basically negligible on the, uh, on, in shaping the, uh, the exciton emission. Okay, thank you. There's a question by Christophe Gallon. He says, uh, fascinating experiments. Uh, why does the line shape look dispersive in the reflectivity uh, maps around the charge neutrality point? Yeah, so- Shouldn't um, we expect an absorption dip from the exciton? Yeah, so actually, uh, if you make your device nicely, and we now, of course, learned uh, to do that, you, uh, in reflection, you expect to get a peak. And, and the highest peak we get is, uh, is about a factor of 20 with respect to the background. The reason is this, that, that if you really design your structure such that the, in the absence of the excitonic resonance, the reflectivity is relatively weak due to arising primarily due to the, um, uh, the dielectric contrast of the different interfaces, then you can have a dramatic effect because the field generate, uh, gener uh, generated in the, um, in the TMD, the excitonic field, can be actually as strong as the incident electric field, okay? So much so that, that if you come in uh, uh, if you had a suspended TMD, if you come in resonantly with, uh, with a, um, say, a laser field, then what you would expect to get if the uh, exciton is uh, purely radiatively broadened is that all the light would be reflected and nothing would be transmitted. So this is similar to what uh, Vahid was talking about yesterday. There with zero D emitters, it's very difficult because of the fact that you have to match the dipolar emission pattern uh, and the Gaussian uh, focus beam. Here you do not have that, right? So you have a 2D emitter. And when you, in, uh, when you shine in uh, basically a, a light field, which is not necessarily focused, okay? So basically if the exciton is radiatively broadened, it would reflect everything. Now, so I, I uh, spoke too much. The reason why this is dispersive here is that these exciton lines, for example, what I show here is uh, substantially broader than what the radiative limit sets uh, gives us. Okay, so I, I, we believe this is due to the fact that the back gate here is gold. So we never saw narrow lines with gold. The other point is that when that is the case, the peak excitonic reflection is weak, is, is smaller than what it would be. Uh, so it would be on the order of 10% in this case, which becomes comparable to reflection from other surfaces, like from gold or from uh, the silicon dioxide silicon interface, which means that, that what you see in, in, in the uh, reflection is an interference of not only the reflection from the MOSC2, but also reflection from other channels. So and that, these that, interferences uh, result in, in a dispersive yeah. line shape. So it's like a funnel line shape where it's you have like a broad a background. Line, precisely, yeah. Yeah. but it, it is possible yeah. to eliminate it if you, divide, uh, if you um, design your structure correctly. And in a sense, this is an example of that, right? So uh, here uh, we designed it such that, that um, we have a, a very nice uh, contrast. Good, thank you, Atach. We have to move on. Mm -hmm. uh, we move to the second speaker of this session and this will be Eugene Polzik. Uh, Eugene, are you here? Yes, I am. Wonderful. So, um, yes, if you can share your screen. Yes, everything works. So I hand over to you, Eugene. Thank you. So, uh, let me thank the organizers for inviting me. It's an exciting meeting. Again, unfortunately, not in person. Um, I will be talking about motion today and- uh, Eugene, we can't see you. Your camera is off, maybe on purpose, but I no, would just wanna make sure that this is no, not a mistake. No, it's not. Uh, oh, you mean you cannot see my face? We you, cannot see your face. But you can see my, my slides, right? Correct. Um, rrr, 
Well, don't worry. I just wanted to make you aware of it. Right. No, but let's just go on like that. So uh, the slides are more important. Um, so I will be talking about motion and uh, quantum motion and what uh, makes me, uh, you know, good for this conference is that it will be a motion of a nanomechanical object. So we have an oscillator and as you can imagine, the oscillator coordinate can be written as sine and cosine components with the canonical variables of x and p. And uh, the x and p can be dimensionless and the normalization will be the zero point fluctuations, which for the oscillators we are talking about will be of the order of one femtometer. So you will later see the exact type of oscillators that we'll be dealing with. And we will be mostly concerned with something like mode 1.1. One, one. Um, what is apparent from already this formula is that there are two non-commuting variables in this story. And so apparently if you measure one of them, then you should impose the quantum back action in the other one and so on. So if we look in the um, phasor diagram, so to say, then uh, if at some instance we're measuring the sine component, that is x, we're imposing the back action into p. And then when we, at the next instance, we are now measuring the cosine component because sine is zero, we're imposing the back action into x. And so the more you measure, the more you disturb your system. So um, the measurement of X imposes the back action on P and the other way around. And um, the quantum back action of the measurement is the limit for the sensitivity. Uh, sorry, I have somebody asking me to admit from the waiting room. Is, is this my business to do it? This is not your business. I think this okay. will be handled automatically. Okay. All right. So this is the close up of the uh, actual oscillators that we're dealing with. Uh, you can see that they're rather macroscopic in two dimensions, but the thickness is truly in the sub hundred uh, nanometers range. Uh, it's an elaborate structure where the central part is the actual oscillator, a drum, and everything else is used to uh, separate this drum motion from the thermal environment. So it's like the phononic band gap structure. Uh, the oscillation frequency is typically about one megahertz. So you can imagine that at room temperature, there is about a million of phonons in this oscillation and uh, the corresponding size of the thermal motion is about uh, a picometer. Um, if you cool this uh, motion down to absolute zero, then you will have something like a femtometer ground state motion. Those oscillators have actually an amazing value of the mechanical Q exceeding 1 billion because of this wonderful phononic band gap structure. And this is why we are able to put them in the quantum regime and we are able to study the quantum states of their motion. So, okay, um, you take such an oscillator you can cool it to the ground state. It still has, of course, its ground state motion. And if you try to measure the motion, then you will impose the quantum back action. And so there will be noise in the system. And uh, what I will tell you uh, about is essentially the way to measure the motion of a quantum oscillator without any principal limits coming from quantum mechanics. So we we'll call it noiseless quantum trajectories. And what you need to do for that is you define the motion relative 
the quantum reference frame, not the classical reference frame. This reference system should have an effective negative mass and I'll explain to you what it means. And finally, an entangled state of the reference and the probe system should be generated. Um, there are references which are describing this work, but I will talk about those references in more detail. So let's first take a simple story where we, are, we have an object described by X and P, and we have the reference frame, which we describe by X naught and P naught. And let's say that we are able to generate an entangled state between the system of interest and the reference frame. The einstein podolsky rosen entanglement means that you can measure the difference of the position operators X and the sum of the momentum operators P with arbitrary accuracy. So let's see what happens. If we now want to measure the position of our oscillator as a function of time in the reference frame of X naught, then the kinematic formula just tells you that this is the difference between the position of the system and the reference frame at zero time, plus the difference of the derivatives in time times the time. And of course, the normal situation, we take the masses to be one, then x dot is p and x naught dot is p naught. And what you have is the difference between the x's and the difference between the p's, they are non-commuting operators. And therefore, despite this entanglement, you cannot measure the motion of one system in the reference frame of the other one. But of course, all you need to do now, at least formally, is to change the sign of the mass, whatever it means, of the reference system. And then you have the difference of the position operators and the sum of the momenta. And those are two commuting variables. And then you can measure the motion of my oscillator with regards to, with respect to the um, negative mass reference frame with arbitrary accuracy, because you can measure once the difference of the axis, the sum of P's, and you know them. And then you know the X and P, that means that you know X as a function of time uh, in this reference frame. The same concerns the oscillator, because in the oscillator, again, you can measure the X and P in the rotating frame with respect to each other this operator commutes with this operator and therefore you can measure the trajectory of the oscillator of interest, this nanomechanical object with respect to the reference oscillator. That actually is equivalent to being able to entangle the two systems because apparently if the variance of this operator and that one is small, then you know the difference between the two positions with arbitrary accuracy. So let me tell you a little more about uh, the measurement of the mechanical motion, how we do it. And uh, we do it by taking the oscillator of interest, this little oscillating membrane, placing it in a standing wave uh, optical cavity. And then, of course, you can imagine that when this piece of dielectric is oscillating in a standing wave, it modulates the standing wave. And if it modulates the standing wave, it creates the sidebands. So if my input light is blue detuned from the optical resonance of this resonator, it generates the blue detuned sideband at the frequency of light plus the frequency of oscillator and the red detuned sideband. In this case, obviously the red detuned sideband 
components for this detuning. And therefore, we have the creation of a photon with the lower frequency, which actually means that the phonon is created as well, because this difference in the frequency should come somewhere. So it's the Hamiltonian which corresponds to the creation of a photon and creation of a phonon. So you can think of it as an entangling Hamiltonian. On the other hand, if you move your laser on the other side of the resonance, then the created photon has a higher frequency, which means that the phonon should be uh, eliminated. And that means a dagger B interaction, which is a beam splitter interaction, which is also a cooling process because you are taking away phonons from this resonator, from this oscillator, and therefore you can cool it in principle very close to the ground state of motion. Finally, if you tune your laser close to the resonance of this optical resonator, then both processes have equal weights. And if you rewrite this Hamiltonian, then you will simply arrive at the quantum non-demolition Hamiltonian. We are looking at the quadrature phase operator of light, either reflected or transmitted through this cavity. You can measure the mechanical position of the, um, of the membrane as a function of time. And this is the result of such a measurement. So we take one of those beautiful membranes, we place it in an optical resonator. The membrane has the resonant frequency of motion of about 1.37 megahertz. Um, this is the full spectrum uh, of the modulation of light on which the mechanical motion is imprinted. And uh, we have nice band gap structure. So in the middle of this band gap, you can very nicely see the bare resonance of the mechanical motion. And if you analyze the origin of this noise spectrum, you will find out that most of this quantum noise comes from the quantum back action of the light on this oscillator. So the radiation pressure of photons actually generates this noise. And the ground state of the oscillator has a very tiny role in it. So this is exactly the regime where we want to be because we want to generate a lot of quantum back action and then cancel it out because this will be the signature of the efficient um, quantum interaction between the two systems. If we can cancel the quantum back action on the two systems, then you can make a measurement on the two of them simultaneously. So that's the snapshot of the experimental setup. We take this membrane, put it in a resonator, and uh, it sits at about 8, 8 Kelvin in the system. So now let's talk about the magic negative mass oscillator. And it's actually a collective spin of an atomic ensemble. So you take an atomic ensemble, you orient the spins optically in one direction, and you think of it as a collective spin. This collective spin has a classical projection in one direction, which we call JZ. And the other two projections can be thought of as your quantum variables. And if you make a minimally uncertain state of the spin, then the only fluctuation in the orthogonal direction will be due to the projection noise of those spins. It will be of the order of square root of the number of spins, and it will be equivalent to the ground state of the oscillator. So now if you think of creating the first excited state of this oscillator, that would be something like that, something like a Fox state on this block sphere. But because it's a sphere, the first excited state will have the energy, which is slightly lower than the ground state because it's just bigger and the, the 
um, sphere has a curvature. And this is in fact the negative mass oscillator because you add an excitation and you reduce its energy. Now you put it in the magnetic field and begins to oscillate, to rotate, and this is our negative mass oscillator. The experimental incarnation uh, is at room temperature atomic sample. There are some technical details which I probably will skip. Uh, the spin lifetime can be very large because uh, the spins are in a specially spin protected environment, but that's not very important for the discussion. So now we want to measure the quantum noise of this spin. We put the system in the magnetic field. We orient the spins as good as we can in the vertical direction. And the quantum fluctuations of the spin, for example, initially in the ground state, will be oscillating at the Zeeman frequency. Then we send light through and we measure the oscillations by simply looking at the polarization of light, which will be oscillating at the Zeeman frequency. And the size of this oscillation will be due to the quantum projection of the spin on the direction of propagation of light. We can decompose it in cosine and sine components and one of them will be proportional to the projection on the z-axis in the rotating frame and the other one to the y and they are renormalized like x and p. Plus the back action noise of course because it's an oscillator you measure one projection you put the back action into the other one and that's the experimental result where again we tune the oscillator by the Larmor frequency to a frequency which is close to the mechanical, in this case 1.47, and we're dominated by the back action of the light imposed on this um, magnetic oscillator. So now we have two oscillators in the right regime, and we can try to show that the quantum back action can be suppressed. So that's the magnetic oscillator in the triple shield of the, for the magnetic field. And uh, this is the snapshot of the experiment. We have the atoms, we have the membrane, we send light through, and we try to observe the reduction of the back action. And uh, this is the paper that was published a couple of years ago where we demonstrated this effect for the negative mass magnetic oscillator and the mechanical motion. And uh, I don't think I have much time to discuss this, but you need to somehow match the masses or the cooperativities of the two systems. And essentially for the atomic system, the cooperativity is equivalent to the optical depth. And for the mechanical frequency, it's a little easier. You can increase the cooperativity by simply increasing the intensity of light. So long story short, I've shown you already something like that. We have the membrane noise spectrum and the uh, dashed area is the um, quantum back action and we have the atoms and the dashed area here is the quantum back action. And if you tune now the atomic frequency to the membrane frequency, you put them together and what you see is a dramatic reduction of the quantum back action. So the area of the quantum back action here is something like six decibel reduced compared to the back action here. So we have the thing working and we now can make the next step by demonstrating that we can entangle those two objects. So those are the heroes in the lab. And uh, to generate entanglement, we essentially need to make this measurement twice and demonstrate that the two results of the measurement of the x minus x naught and p plus p naught are correlated better 
than uh, the standard quantum limit or than the ground state noise of the systems. So um, the mechanical oscillator is of course interacting with the thermal environment, but if we do the experiment quickly, then we can actually consider it frozen around a certain point. And then when we make a measurement, then those pink areas demonstrate the size of the quantum back action. And the point is, of course, that for the two oscillators, the mechanical one and the spin one, the back action is correlated. And so whenever you make a measurement, the results are random within the back action uncertainty, but are correlated. So uh, in more specific terms, we run the uh, continuous measurement of the uh, photocurrent of the light transmitted through the two systems. We do some winner filtering analysis and uh, long and behold, we can calculate the uncertainty of the cosine component of the photocurrent of the light coming through the two systems in the sign. And you can see here, one of the blue curve is for the cosine component and the um, yellow one for the sine component. And if we do the nice analysis, then we can actually observe something which I hope you will be able to see here. So this is the experimental realization. And what you see here is the results of the two consecutive measurements on the two systems. And as you can see, the result of the measurement is random, but the two measurements are extremely well correlated because they are essentially within this blue circle and the blue circle is smaller than the ground state uncertainty presented by this um, uh, purple circle. So qualitatively is like that. Quantitatively is the degree of entanglement demonstrated here, which means that we are below the ground state uncertainty. So the entanglement of the two objects, a spin ensemble and uh, the mechanical oscillator has been demonstrated. And uh, with that, I think I, come to the end of my talk, hopefully on time. And uh, the bottom line is essentially, there is no fundamental limit for the measurement of motion if you do it in the correct reference frame. And that basically means that you can also measure the force on the mechanical oscillator with in principle arbitrary accuracy. And uh, if you apply those principles for instance, to the gravitational wave interferometry, then you can, in principle, detect gravitational waves interferometrically with arbitrary accuracy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Eugene. Um, very inspiring, the concept of a negative mass. Um, I'm still processing here how this spin system so you're saying the spin system reduces its energy and that is equivalent to a negative mass is that's correct no this is correct yes so what is not clear to me here is the following so if i don't have this negative mass trick then i i would usually measure my optimal measurement would be at the heisenberg limit no the, the measurement noise would be equal to the back action noise and now you're saying i have to go to the strong back action limit right and then because the I'm, two I'm, back actions the two back actions they have opposite signs in the signal yes i understand that but you showed 6 db and now i i wonder if i just operated from the beginning on at the heisenberg limit would i be better off or not 
No, because what I have demonstrated, sorry, first of all, you know, let's let's agree. Some people close the call, the Heisenberg limit is one over N, where N is the number of particles. This is not what we're talking about. We're talking about the standard quantum limit. Sorry, I, that's what I meant, right? sorry. Yeah. Where the precision of the measurement due to the measurement apparatus and the imprecision due to the quantum back action they are equal, they balance out, and therefore you have this standard quantum limit. So the fact that we have demonstrated entanglement straightforwardly proves that we're doing better than we would be doing without any of those tricks. So that's equivalent, that's one-to-one -one correspondence. If you demonstrate the entanglement, that means that you are beyond the standard quantum limit. That makes sense, right, right. Yeah. Okay, um, now I check here in the chat if there are any questions, no questions coming. So in this case, I thank you a lot for your presentation. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would move on to actually the coffee break. Is that correct? Yes, the agenda says that there is a coffee break. So, um, I hope you are all back. Uh, welcome to the second part of this session. And uh, we start with the first speaker, who is um, Andreas Norman. No, um, Andreas, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you and hello, everybody. So yeah, um, my name is Andreas Norman. And first of all, I just want to thank the organizers for this very interesting conference and also for giving me this nice opportunity to present some of my own research. So I'm currently actually a member of Lucas Group at ETH, but today I will present some theoretical research regarding my external collaboration with Jose Gil from Spain and also Tero Setal and Ari Friberg from Finland on the spin structure or the spin angular momentum structure of so-called three-dimensional polarization states. Uh, and after a brief introduction, I will first to explain to you what we even mean by these 3D polarization states. And then I will uh, present you a general expression for the spin vector or the spin angular momentum density vector of such states. And in this connection, I will also say some words about so-called principal intensities. Then I will also discuss uh, about intensity isotropy and so-called purity of a 3D polarization state, and then how these concepts are, are related to the spin of such a state. Then I will also discuss about uh, a rather novel uh, concept in coherence and random polarization theory, namely non-regular polarization states, and especially how the degree of non-regularity of such a state affects the spin. And then before the conclusions, I will try to bring this general treatment more closer to this nanophotonics context. And as an example, I will, will consider a simple partially polarized evanescent wave and show that uh, such a way is always in, in, in this 3D polarization state. Okay, and, and today it's already well known uh, that uh, if we have a well collimated paraxial beam of light, its angular momentum can then show up either via spin angular momentum, which is related to the polarization state, or via orbital angular momentum, which is then connected to the wave from twisting. And when we inter uh, interacting with a small nanoparticle, for example, the spin angular momentum can then uh, induce a rotation of the particle around its own axis, while the orbital angular momentum can then uh, put this particle in an orbital motion around the axis of the beam. And today I will then uh, discuss about the spin angular momentum and exclusively about the spin uh, uh, related to the electric part of the field. And now it then turns out that this electric spin angular momentum density, which we hereafter will then just call spin, of a purely monochromatic light field in free space can be written in this way. So what we have here is uh, the free space permittivity. This is the angular frequency of the light. And then this vector 
E is the complex uh, vector amplitude of this monochromatic electric field in this complex representation. And then the magnitude of this spin vector is directly connected to this so-called degree of circular polarization, which is then a measure uh, for the difference between the amount of left-hand circularly polarized light and the amount of right-hand circularly polarized light. So this relation al already shows this uh, close connection between the spin and polarization of the light. And what we have here is actually what is usually considered uh, in, in, in many studies, namely spin of monochromatic light. But then again, this is also a rather like limited and also uh, an idealized case because here the field is always totally deterministic, which is never the case in a practical situation. And also because for monochromatic light, the field is always uh, bounded to a fixed plane in space at a given point. So our objective was then to explore the spin structure of more general light fields, which then can have some random fluctuations and also where the field is no longer restricted to fluctuate in a, in a plane. And this brings us uh, then to this concept of, of these 3D polarization states. So uh, a 3D polarization state is a state of light for which the electric field fluctuates in three spatial orthogonal directions at a single point in space in any chosen coordinate system. So no matter how you choose your frame of reference, you will never find a plane in which the field is restricted. And it turns out that these kind of states of flight, they cannot occur in monochromatic light fields and not in paraxial fields, but they can show up in tightly focused random light and also random optical near fields. And this is what makes them also interesting then in this nanophotonics context. And uh, perhaps the most usual way then to characterize these 3D states is to use this so-called three times three polarization matrix which I have here then written in the spectral domain, but the similar formulation can also be done in the temporal domain. So what we consider here is then random light at some given point and at some angular frequency omega. And then this, uh, uh, this uh, statistical properties of, of this random uh, electric field, which is gen in general a three component vector, is then considered as an ensemble average over monochromatic realizations. And then uh, regarding the mathematics, uh, because this uh, polarization matrix is, uh, is a Hermitian and positive, positive, positive semi-definite matrix, it can always then be diagonalized by a unitary transformations with the eigenvalues being then always non-negative real numbers. And then uh, as an example, I then con will consider this uh, perhaps most ex extreme case with so-called unpolarized 3D light uh, for which there are no correlations between any of these three orthogonal components and where the spectral densities are the same in, in all these directions, which means that all of the eigenvalues are the same and the whole polarization matrix will then be just proportional to this uh, three times three identity matrix. And in physical terms, this then means that now the field fluctuates completely randomly and also completely isotropically in this whole 3D space. And from now on, I will then drop these uh, arguments from here just to keep the notation uh, a little bit more simpler. And after doing this, uh, uh, this polarization matrix will then have this explicit form in an arbitrary X, Y, Z coordinate system. And now as Mark Dennis uh, showed some time ago is that this matrix can then always be decomposed into a symmetric real part and into a skew symmetric imaginary part. And due to this property, we can then apply an orthogonal transformation or a rotation which then diagonalizes this symmetric real part of this matrix. And in this so-called intrinsic frame, these diagonal elements here are then the eigenvalues of the real part of this polarization matrix, which, which are then usually called principal intensities of the state. And, and the reason for this wording here is that now we represent this polarization matrix in a frame where these spectral densities along three orthogonal directions 
align with the so-called principal axis of what Dennis calls the intensity ellipsoid of this state. So what we have here is then formally similar to when we diagonalize the symmetric inertial tensor of an um, rigid body in classical mechanics. And then uh, uh, we can observe that the second term here, this has then the structure of an angular velocity tensor. And it actually then turns out that uh, these components of this imaginary part then uh, form the components of the spin vector of this state in this intrinsic frame. And if we would be uh, very careful here, then we should multiply this vector by this epsilon zero divided by four omega in order to then have proper dimensions of an angular momentum density. But usually this prefactor is then just dropped out in order to keep the treatment more simple. And now from this intrinsic frame, we can then go to an arbitrary frame again by using a rotation. And what we then find is this completely general relation between the spin vector and a polarization matrix of an arbitrary 3D polarization state. So, uh, and then instead of using, uh, working with this like actual spin vector, one usually then works with this in like dimensionless and normalized spin vector. And this will always then be bounded between zero and one. And before I will uh, say some more, or more about this spin vector, I will say some words about this, uh, these principal intensities, because they then provide a, a, like a formal framework to give a rigorous definition for what we mean by a 3D polarization state, or, or like a dimensionality of light in general. So in the case that only one of these principal intensities is non-zero, we have one delay. And, and in this case, we can always identify a single direction in space where the field fluctuates. Then for 2D light, we can always find a plane in space where the field fluctuates. And in, in this general case, when the three eigenvalues are non-zero, then we have a 3D polarization state and we can never find a plane in which the field fluctuates. And then it can also be uh, shown that for any type of monochromatic light, this third eigenvalue will always be zero, which means that 3D monochromatic light does not exist. And this can also be actually already shown in a book of Born and Wolf. So what we have here, this provides now like a formal definition of what we mean by a 3D polarization state, but it still doesn't say so much how 3D the state in question is. And to quantify this a little bit more further, one can then use uh, the so-called polarimetric dimension, which is then a renormalized quantity of the so-called dimensionality index, including the Frobenius norm and being then the matrix distance between this trace normalized positive part of the polarization matrix or, or real part of the polarization matrix and the three times three unit matrix, which then corresponds to completely isotropic light in this 3D space. And this polymetric dimension, it should not be associated with a real physical dimension, but more as an effective or fractal dimension that then characterizes this intensity distribution spread of this state in 3D space. And for 1D light, it is always equal to one, for 2D light, it's between one and two, and for 3D light, it can take any value in this range. And the reason uh, for this property here can be understood by looking at this example here, where we now have then formally a 3D polarization state. So all of these three eigenvalues are strictly non-zero, but one of the, or this first eigenvalue is much larger than the two other ones, which means that most of the energy density is then confined along a single direction in space and hence the field is effectively like a 1D field. And then we have also explored a little bit uh, further the actually this the spin uh, character of these kind of uh, maximally intensity isotropic states and what we were uh, enabled then to derive were these fundamental bounds for the amount of spin carried by such a state. And here is at least somewhat interesting, this upper bound, 
because now we have then a state for which the field fluctuates completely isotropical in this whole 3D space. But nonetheless, uh, the, the state can uh, carry a rather high degree of spin. And then for an arbitrary state of flight, uh, what is then dictates is actually fundamental amount of spin in the system is specified by something that is called the degree of purity, which is then very similar to, the, to this purity of a tree level quantum system. And it can also be seen as the closest analog to the concept of degree of polarization that you have in the standard like paraxial uh, treatment. So in this two for, 2D formalism, it can then be shown that the two times two polarization metric can always be decomposed into a fully polarized part and into a fully unpolarized part. And then the degree of polarization is defined as the ratio between the energy density contained in the fully polarized part uh, with respect to the total energy density of the state. But now in this 3D formalism, it turns out that in general, we cannot decompose the three times three polarization matrix into a fully polarized part and into a fully unpolarized 3D part. So we cannot, we cannot introduce a, a measure like degree of polarization in the same way as we do in, the, in this 2D formalism. But what we can use is this so-called degree of 3D purity, which is then the matrix distance between the trace normalized uh, polarization matrix and then the three times three unit matrix, which corresponds to a completely unpolarized 3D light. And, and this measure has sent then some natural uh, properties, but here uh, the, the most important thing is this fundamental relation then between the degree of purity the dimensionality index and the amount of spin carried by an arbitrary 3D state. So, so this re, from this relation, we can then see that this purity really then dictates the, the, the upper bound that can be contained uh, or how much spin can be contained in, in a state. Okay, and then as I said, uh, in this 3D formalism, we cannot in general decompose this three times three polarization matrix into a fully polarized part and into a fully unpolarized part. But what we can always do is to decompose into three terms. So, uh, uh, and one is this uh, fully polarized part. Then we have this fully 3D unpolarized part and then a middle term here. And, and this matrix U here in this expression uh, is then the unitary trans, uh, matrix, which uh, diagonalizes the whole polarization matrix. And nowadays, uh, this middle part is then called the discriminating state. And the reason for this wording is then that uh, it allows to divide or discriminate all possible 3D polarization states into two main categories, uh, which are then called regular states and non-regular states. And these two classes, they then have a lot of different mathematical and, and physical properties. But here I have then uh, just uh, listed like the, the main differences between these classes. And from a mathematical perspective, for a regular state, this uh, middle part is always a real valued matrix. While for a non-regular state, this middle part is always a complex valued matrix. Then from a physical point of view, this middle part uh, for a regular state always describes 2D unpolarized light. In other words, light for which the field fluctuates completely randomly and isotropically in a plane. And then obviously such a state does not carry any spin. Then uh, again, for a non-regular state, this middle part always describes genuine 3D light. And what is more interesting here that it turns out that this middle part always carries non-zero spin. So if we have a non-regular 3D polarization state, we know that it always carries non-zero spin. And this also means that the spin vector of a general 3D polarization state can then be written as a sum of two terms, where this first term is then the spin arising from this fully polarized part 
And then the second term here is the spin arising from this discriminating state. And why this is then interesting is that there is no such correspondence in this paraxial spin treatment. In other words, in this 2D formalism, the whole spin of the state is always uh, specified by the spin carried by this fully polarized part. But now in this 3D formalism, we have this additional term, uh, and this has no uh, analog in, in this paraxial tree. And then it also turns out that the magnitude of, of, of this second term here, it's actually directly connected to what is called the degree of non-regularity of the state. And this is a rather technical thing, which I will not go into now, but I will just mention that whenever the field is in a regular state, this quantity will be zero. And from this re relation, we then see that this uh, second term will vanish, which means that for a non or for a regular 3D polarization state, the spin structure is somewhat similar to what you have in the paraxial treatment. Then again, if we have a non-regular state, then this quantity will always be non-zero, which means that the magnitude of this second term of the spin vector will also be always non-zero. So for a non-regular polarization state, this second term will always be there. Okay, and then my, my last slide, then I, uh, I tried to get, bring this general form is more closer to this nanophotonics context. And, and here I then will consider a very simple example with a random evanescent wave, which is then generated in total internal reflection by, uh, by a non-polarized uh, plane wave field, which contains then an S-polarized component and a P-polarized component. And now by representing this incoming field as a monochromatic realization, we can then write the corresponding realization for the evanescent wave in this way in this X, Y, Z coordinate system. So what we have here is then these amplitudes, uh, two amplitudes of this incoming wave. Then here we have the Fresnel transmission coefficients for these two uh, polarizations. And then the rest of the quantities are, are just given here. So, so this expression, this is, uh, exactly the same form that you, you find in standard like nano-optics textbooks where you consider monochromatic uh, evanescent waves. But now the difference is here that now we consider a realization, which means that we have an additional degree of freedom in the system, which is this input correlation coefficient uh, between this S and P polarized components of the incoming light. So this, this term here, it specifies fully then the statistical properties of the evanescent wave. And now then by using um, this expression here and, and then constructing the polarization matrix and, and using all kinds of mathematical tricks, one can then show uh, that whenever this incident wave and hence the evanescent wave is not fully polarized, then the um, this third eigenvalue uh, uh, of the evanescent wave will always be non-zero, which physically means that it will always be in a tr genuine 3D state and you can never find a plane it was in which the field fluctuates. And it can be also shown that it will always be in a non-regular state, which means that the evanescent wave will always carry a non-zero spin term arising from this discriminating component which then means that you cannot get rid of the spin of, an, of this kind of evanescent wave. And this is interesting then that because if we consider a fully polarized evanescent wave or then a wave like a normal refracted wave, which is generated below the critical angle, then it will always be in a 2D state with non, no non-regular character. And what this spin term here also then actually implies is that this evanescent wave can never be unpolarized, not in the 2D formalism and not in the 3D formalism. So this just means that an evanescent wave, which would be unpolarized, does not exist. Then as Andreas, the last... Andreas, I'm sorry, you have two minutes to the end. Yes, I, I will finish now. So yeah, and here I just want to mention uh, that I will just became aware of a very recent publication 
where they then experimentally demonstrate, actually in the group of Anatoly Tsayats, and where they generate uh, this partially polarized evanescent wave by using a fully unpolarized incident beam. And in this case, it turns out that this, this spin of the evanescent wave will be purely transfer in nature. But this is actually not uh, only the case when you have an unpolarized input, but it's, uh, it, it will always be the case when this input correlation coefficient goes to zero. And, and this is actually easy to understand even without any mathematics. And then I also, also want to mention that similar kind of features uh, are found in tightly focused uh, random bees as shown in, in one of our publications and also in this Nature of Photonics publication. So uh, in summary, what we have done here is to study then the spin structure of this general 3D polarization states, which cannot be found with monochromatic light. And, and, and the spin character of these kind of state is then closely related to the purity and this intensity distribution of the state. And, and then uh, one important thing here is that uh, for a non-regular state, uh, we always have then additional spin term, which has no correspondent in this uh, paraxial treatment. And then uh, as a take home message uh, here is that any partially polarized evanescent wave is always in this non-regular state, which means that we'll always carry spin and it can never be unpolarized. Then I want to just uh, apologize that even if this is a, even if this is a quantum conference, I have not said a single word about quantum here. And the reason for this is that we have just started this quantum approach here and we try to formulate a quantum theory of these 3D states. So with this, I want to acknowledge then uh, the, the funding agencies here and my collaborators. So thank you very much. Thank you, Andreas. Hey, unfortunately, uh, we have to move on to stay okay. on time. Yeah, there I is a there is a question though please check the chat uh, chat box okay and and uh, it would be nice if you could reply uh, by email okay okay you can also type it directly in here if you want okay so thank you again and we move on in the program to the next speaker and this will be sebastian slama from tubingen and i hope sebastian is here yes can you hear and see me well I can see you very well. So uh, you can upload your um, uh, presentation. I mean, share the I presentation. Try. So can you see it? We can see it. Yeah. So you're ready to go. OK, so let me start by thanking the organizers for giving me the chance to present our latest results. That is on surface plasma-based dispersive detection and spectroscopy of ultra cold. Yes, this leads to a free spectral range of the cavity, which is on the order of the absorption and the fluorescence bandwidth of the dye. So in principle, um, the absorption and the fluorescence of the dye only overlaps with a single longitudinal cavity mode. So that means the longitudinal degree of freedom is frozen out and the system um, essentially becomes two dimensional. And then the second um, essential feature here is the um, curvature of these mirrors then gives a rise to a, a harmonic potential for the um, cavity photons in the transverse direction. And also um, we have a very well-defined ground state in the system. So now well, what you do to um, observe a uh, einstein condensation is you pump the dye solution. That means light will get absorbed and um, uh, re-emitted and uh, um, in a, in a lot of um, consecutive cycles. And during the time that the light is um, absorbed, so the molecules are in some excited state, they will actually scatter off surrounding particles quite frequently and thereby thermalize to the environment. So that means when the photon is re-emitted, it will uh, be emitted from a thermalized molecular state and also adapt to this uh, thermal distribution. And now, in principle, um, you just have to increase um, your uh, particle number, the photon number in the system, so you overcome uh, uh, um, yeah, the defined threshold for Bose-Einstein condensation. So when you do the experiment and look at the emission from the cavity, this upper image here is what you find when you're below the critical particle number. So you just see a thermal cloud of photons, and then 
once you're above the critical particle number, you can see this bright peak emerging in the center, which is then the forming of the condensate. And you can also see this in the spectra. Um, when you're below the, the critical pump power, you just see a um, Boltzmann distribution of the um, cavity photons. And then once you overcome the threshold for both Einstein condensation, you can see a, um, yeah, a, a sharp peak emerging at the cavity cutoff. And now um, the system is very uh, versatile because um, due to this thermalization mechanism, you cannot only work with the harmonic potential, but you can really think of uh, lots of different potentials, which you then can, um, that the photons can be thermalized to the ground state very effectively. And um, so my talk today is um, divided into parts. And the first part, I wanna talk to you um, about some technique that we use to um, structure our cavity mirrors, um, which then allows us to create arbitrary chirping potentials. And in the second part, um, I wanna talk a little bit about our ongoing research on phase dynamics and such um, coupled um, condensate systems. Okay, so um, to start off, um, Let's first consider a cavity which is um, built by two plane mirrors. And then the potential that the, the photon gas sees in this cavity is given by this expression. So um, it, uh, yeah, the d naught here is the, the distance of the two mirrors. And then you can alter this potential either by a local refractive index variation or by a local um, variation of the surface structure of the mirrors. And I want to be focusing today on this um, surface structuring. So um, to, to, to create potentials, then we make use of a technique which is called the surface delamination. And this is induced by, by heat. So we, in our experiment, we use um, special kinds of mirrors which have between the substrate and the dielectric coating, there's a very thin layer of silicon. And now you can take a laser beam and focus it down onto the silicon layer. And what, what will happen is some part of the light will get absorbed. You induce heat in the system. And then um, at some point, the surface will buckle up, um, which is depicted over here. And um, now if you arrange a cavity out of these two mirrors, um, this is what the resulting potential will look like. So you have this sort of Gaussian peak in the middle. And now you can do this in a very controlled way. So moving around the laser um, over the silicon layer and modulating the laser power at the same time and thereby create almost arbitrary trapping potentials. And to give you an idea of what we can do, for example, this here is an, a contour plot um, of, of one of the uh, mirror surfaces and we imprinted the logo of our university onto this mirror surface um, or um, he, over here, you can see um, just a, a grid of dots with um, varying height up to 30 nanometers. Okay, so um, now you know um, how the structuring of mirror surfaces works. Um, so let's consider more complicated potential for light. It's still fairly easy to understand. So um, let's consider a double well potential. Uh, the cavity environment would then look um, somewhat like this. So you have your dye solution in between and then there's two wells next to each other. And if you make now a cut in this horizontal direction, the potential um, which the photon gas sees would look like this. So just two wells next to each other and they can be actually coupled by tunneling. And you can tune this, uh, the strengths of the tunnel coupling um, essentially by the distance of these two wells. And now if you um, pump the system and look at the emission from your cavity, um, just as you expect, you um, see that the light is actually very effectively trapped in these two potential minima. Um, so you can see two bright spots here. And, and what you can also do is you can just pump one of the wells and scan the, the relative um, detuning between the two wells, um, which is shown over here, which my colleague David did. Um, and then you, you measure the um, energy of your photons that escape from the cavity and you can find um, some very characteristic, uh, characteristic, characteristic um, signs of some avoided crossing, which is uh, expected to occur in such a dressed state system then. So 
this tells us um, that um, yeah, just like you would expect, um, there's a coherent hybridized state forming on such a double well system. But our question was, um, so, so this was some like with very strong pumping and um, not with the right density of states. So it was far away from thermal equilibrium and also not in the Bose-Einstein condensed phase. So our question was, um, can we also achieve Bose-Einstein condensation in such a, a double well system? And the answer to this is yes. But before I'm gonna show you how um, this can be done, I wanna remind you of um, the, the double well system in general. So we have two wells next to each other. They are both at some, some energy. There can be some energy offset uh, between them, delta. Um, they are both described by a single wave function, um, psi one and psi two, and then there can be this tunnel coupling J. And now you can write down the Hamiltonian. It's just very standard, easy two by two Hamiltonian. And you can find the um, eigen energies and the new eigen states. And um, the, the eigen states in the case where you have zero detuning, they just give you this um, symmetric and anti-symmetric um, superposition state psi plus and psi minus, which are here depicted on the right. Um, so uh, that is the ground state for our system. And now to achieve Bose-Einstein condensation in such a superposition ground state, you actually have to provide the right density of states. And you can do that um, by embedding your double well in a harmonic trap. And in, inside a harmonic trapping potential. So this is a work done by my colleague Christian. Um, here again, you can see the contour plot of such a potential and the, in the center, these two white spots are the potential minima of the double well. And then this is surrounded by this uh, harmonic trapping potential. And if you make a cut along the vertical here, this is what it would look like. So you have the harmonic oscillator states, um, at, at higher energy. And then within this double well, there's the um, um, symmetric and the anti-symmetric um, superposition state confined. Okay, um, now when you assemble a cavity with such a potential and you do the experiment, um, then you can again have a look at the spatial emission. And what you see is below the critical particle number, you just see a thermal cloud um, again, um, emerging from the cavity. And when you overcome the critical particle number, you can see that the light very effectively gathers inside this double well um, potential. Um, you can also see that in the spectrum. So this upper plot here is the spectrum below the threshold. Um, and you can see um, all of the different modes that exist in the system um, and they are um, populated following the Boltzmann distribution. And then when you overcome again, the, the threshold for condensation, you can see that actually this um, symmetric um, superposition ground state is um, populated the most. And the, this, uh, the, the population of these states now follows um, a Bose-Einstein distribution. And now a very, um, yeah, a very characteristic, characteristic feature of Bose-Einstein condensation is also its coherence. So you can also measure this. Um, when you um, take, um, so, so, so you can take the um, emission out of the two wells and um, recombine them. So bring them to interference on a beam splitter. And when you then overcome again, the, the critical particle number, you can see some interference pattern emerging in the region where they overlap. Um, and also this um, interference pattern is, is, is um, stable in time. So um, this is a very strong indication of that um, you actually um, achieve a macroscopic occupation of this ground state and it is also um, a coherent superposition just like you would expect. Okay, um, so um, that's all I wanted to say to you to um, Bose-Einstein condensation in such a double well um, system. Um, now I wanna move on to the second part of my talk, which is about um, the phase dynamics of 
coupled condensates. So condensates sitting in such a double well system. And um, to, to um, um, introduce you to this, um, yeah, what, what's happening in such a system, let's first consider a single condensate. Um, and this is here um, what the what a wave function of such a single condensate would look like. So the amplitude of the wave function is proportional to the particle number, the, the square root of the particle number. And then you have this phase factor here. And the reason why I put uh, some time dependence here um, at this uh, phi in the, in, the, in the phase is because the phase actually is very heavily influenced by number fluctuations. Um, so when you, when you have a condensate where the particle number is not constant over time, but it is fluctuating, this will definitely have some effect on the phase. Um, I'll make that clear in a second. So to measure the, the phase evolution or the phase dynamics of your um, condensate, uh, you, you would have to do a phase sensitive measurement. And how can you do that? Um, well, by interference, for example, so you can take condensate light and um, bring it to superposition with some stable local oscillator, for example, a laser, uh, and then measure the beating um, signal out of this. And this is what my colleague Julian did um, a while ago. First of all, um, this is some results he obtained when you're in the canonical limit. So this is the, the, the thermodynamic regime uh, where you have a very little number fluctuations. So the, the, um, the particle number in your condensate is uh, always very close to the mean particle number as shown over here. And then you can see that over time, you just observe a very stable beating pattern um, with a constant frequency. And now this uh, very significantly changes when you go to a more grand canonical um, statistical regime. So where you have more particle fluctuations, uh, fluctuations shown over here. Um, then you will have um, the case where you have every once in a while, you have discontinuities in your beating pattern. And you can really attribute then these discontinuities to phase changes of your condensate light because you have the stable uh, local oscillator. This doesn't fluctuate at all in its phase. So where these discontinuities have to come from is from um, the condensate light. Um, and now, um, yeah, this is for a single condensate. So our question um, now is, what is the situation for condensates um, that sit in such a double well system? Um, and here in, in such a system, there's actually two uh, relevant time scales. So first of all, we have two wells, uh, one well on the left side, one well on the right side. And they are both coupled to a reservoir of size M. And with this reservoir, they can exchange um, heat and also particles. Um, and the um, yeah, rate by which this happens is basically determined by some Einstein coefficients. And now there can also be tunneling between these two wells. And we can engineer the tunneling rate on a scale of um, say one to 50 gigahertz roughly. And then there's a second, um, uh, very relevant time scale in the system, which is the dephasing rate. So the rate at which both these condensates make a phase change. And this can be in principle controlled by the size of the reservoir M. Um, now we again do some interference measurements, but this time we uh, take the light out of each well and um, bring it to interference on a beam splitter. Um, and let's first consider the uncoupled case. So the tunneling rate is zero and also we're in the canonical um, regime. So dephasing uh, doesn't occur. And then again, you just see some stable oscillation with constant, um, constant beating frequency. And you can do this now um, for um, a lot of different realizations of your experiment, correct all of these interference signals for their phase. Um, and then you can uh, just uh, yeah, make a histogram of all of the phases that you obtained and you will see that they are randomly distributed between minus pi and pi. So there's no um, phase actually favored um, of these two condensates, which is what you would, would expect. 
Um, you can also go to the strongly coupled regime. So the, the tunneling rate now is um, a very large and we're still in the canonical regime. So gamma doesn't play a role here. And now you can take a short laser pulse, just excite one of the condensates and you will find over time that the light tunnels back and forth in between the two wells, um, which is also here present in this oscillating G2 function then. And what this means is you, you kind of observe some coherent uh, Rabi oscillations in your um, double well system. And now um, the, the uh, exciting question actually is what happens if this tunneling rate is uh, on the order of the dephasing rate. So we, we have to leave the canonical regime, go to the grand canonical regime, allow for tunneling and dephasing at the same time. And there I want to show you some um, uh, results that we obtained recently. This is all preliminary, um, but we see some very interesting effects. Um, for example, we see some phase locking effect, uh, which we call it. So what, what you can see here is um, in, in red and um, in green. Um, these are the, the intensities we obtain from the two exit ports of the, of the beam splitter where we, where we bring the um, two wells to interference. And um, then in blue is the, the relative phase we um, extract from this. And you can see that actually there's not really a beating visible now, but more um, like a splitting between the two exits. So there's constructive interference at one exit port of the beam splitter and destructive interference at the other exit port of the beam splitter, uh, which means that um, actually your, your um, inputs um, so the light coming from the two wells has to be in some common state or has to share a common phase. So we think this could be um, because they are actually in such a superposition state. Um, and then this, the second thing that we think is quite interesting is um, there seems to be um, a favor for only discrete phase changes, which is, for example, um, an example um, I, I show you here. Uh, where you can really see that the exit ports of the of the interferometer they just change um, the role over time. So you can see see uh, yeah, kind of phase jumps between zero and pi, and this could mean that the system is jumping between um, the state the, the symmetric state psi plus and psi minus. Although we're not quite sure what exactly causes this. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about um, our future work because we have some, some open questions. I, I put them here. For example, um, we can't at the moment really explain um, the time scale for, this, for these jumps. Um, they, they should be um, much quicker. So um, actually, is there something more to the system? For example, we could think of a potent currents between the two wells. So it will be very interesting to um, look at the evolution of the population in left and right well. And also um, we know that the detuning between the two wells plays really a crucial role um, to um, yeah, get the results looking like this. So we, we have to investigate um, very in detail what, what is the exact role of the detuning. Okay, and, and with that, I want to come to, to my conclusion. Um, so I presented to you how we can um, shape uh, variable trapping potentials for our light. Um, and we can then use it as some experimental tool or some, yeah, some experimental tool to minimize the energy to, to find the ground state. And also I've showed to you um, how we achieved Bose Einstein condensation in such a um, superposition state. And also um, I've um, presented to you um, about um, the, the phase dynamics um, of coupled condensates where you have an uncoupled regime, just a coherent evolution of the phases and a strongly coupled regime, Rabi oscillations. And then in this intermediate regime, this is what we're working on at the moment. Um, you seem to have um, like a favor for discrete phase jumps. So yeah, with that, I want to thank you for your attention, um, for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. And again, we're reaching the end of the time. Um, but allow me to ask a short question. It wasn't clear to me when you introduced your system, you, you were talking about harmonic oscillator states.
-hmm. And I ask myself, what determines the spacing there, the energy spacing between these states? Okay, um, so it's, um, yeah, it's, I, I think I forgot to mention this. This is only in the parxial um, approximation. So when you're talking about um, photons that are very close to the um, optical axis inside your cavity, and um, the, the spacing between the energy states then is in principle um, determined by the exact distance of the mirrors and by the radius of curvature of the mirrors. So by having a more um, a shorter radius of curvature, you can um, increase the distance between the harmonic trap levels for your system. Okay, and then, uh, well, now I hold my uh, second question back because there is a question from mm -hmm. the audience. So this is Christophe Gallon who asks, what properties of the dyes are important for these experiments? How is the different how is it different from polariton condensates? Okay, so um, I think um, there's um, really, um, it's very similar to polariton condensates as far as I know. Um, so the, the important properties for the dye is actually that your, um, um, the, the, the separation between the absorption and the emission profiles, so they, they have to overlap um, to a good extent. And um, 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 also, yeah, you, you have to kind of um, have good enough quantum efficiency. That is, we, we tried different um, kind of dyes and solvents um, in the first um, days of this experiment. And obviously, you don't want to lose too many photons then. Um, so the, the quantum efficiency is also very crucial. OK. Uh, you know, I would have a follow-up question, but unfortunately time is out okay yeah okay thank you very much andreas thank you very and much. we move to the last um presentation of today and this is by igor aronovich aronovich i'm i'm very bad with pronouncing your last name and i must say i very much appreciate that you're joining this meeting because you're tuning in from sydney in australia and i think this is brutally early over there i think five o'clock or something so um, yes, thank, you. thank you lucas i hope you yes, had enough coffee <laughs> take it away from here <laughs> yes indeed uh, so it's uh, yeah, 10 to 6 um, so it's, it's a bit quite early so if i'm a bit incoherent uh, please accept my apologies. So I think the screen is uh, shared. Is it all clear, right? Uh, so I will just start. Um, so yes, so today we'll um, talk a little bit about um, the origin of quantum emitters in HBN uh, and also on our, about our recent results. And uh, it's my second meeting um, in this series. So I, I, I wrote here that I wish I would be in Benask, I think, as most of us. Uh, it was a beautiful time in 2019. So I hope to come back maybe in two years uh, okay, so um, basically, uh, let me see. Yeah, so I think I'm the last speaker of the session and it's not the first day, so I don't need to introduce to you anything in terms of uh, quantum, but I think I will just mention one slide that uh, overall the quantum applications these days rely mostly on sensing uh, and of course computing and, and communications and essentially the quantum internet. So where the solid state single photon sources come into play are mostly around the sensing where you need some sort of degree of freedom in terms of spin optical readout. Uh, in here, of course, the pioneering center is the NV center in Diamond. Um, and in terms of future uh, quantum communications and, and the quantum internet where you do need to have uh, quantum repeaters and, and access to memory. And here I highlighted some of the earlier work for the group of Rampe that uh, perform these communications and computation, or at least some sort of two qubits or two nodes um, fundamental network uh, with trapped ions. And of course, we want to move towards solid state sources and realize basically a very similar uh, application towards what people refer to as quantum internet. Um, and of course, if you don't have any uh, spin access, if you just want to perform quantum communications and just need a very bright uh, single photon source, that's where uh, sources are also uh, required. So 
If you look at the library of single photon sources, these days, uh, actually quite a few of them are available, single molecules and quantum dots uh, and defects in carbon nanotubes and graphene. And of course, uh, our interest lies in this color centers in, in, in solids. And even here, uh, you have a, uh, systems like diamond, which is well studied, silicon carbide, et cetera, et cetera. So the reason why we started thinking about HBN a few years back now is because of its band gap. So of course, if you look at single defects, uh, you would like to be, if you would like to work with materials with very high uh, band gap. So maybe about six EV, uh, five EV, that's diamond and HBN respectively, because you want your ground and excited state to be well within the gap. You don't want to interfere with any of the bands to really achieve what's called an artificial atom or artificial ion. So in this regard, HBN is great. So it's a 6 EV band gap, but also the unique part of HBN is it can be exfoliated into basically atomically thin materials. And I must admit straight away that in most of my talks, the materials that we work with are not truly monolayers. They're more like few layers HBN, but they're all um, 2D nature. So they're all uh, very large, micron or even longer uh, in, in XY dimension and very, very thin. So few, between one and five nanometers. So in the realm of uh, 2D materials, of course, you have uh, these two families by now very well established. So the single photonometers and TMDCs, they were actually first. Um, and here um, you can create them by positioning them on pillars and you can gate them and um, they operate mostly at cryogenic temperatures. Um, and they are related or still under debate, but either to defect or to a bound exciton. And uh, other emitters, mostly in HBN, are based on defects uh, that are not related, not over, not undergoing any transition with the band gap. Um, and so this this is a cartoon. So you have a ground and an excited state well within the band gap. And this is one of the first uh, original works uh, by Ton and, and and others. So. It shows you that you can have it basically in monolayer and in a multilayer um, HBN. Okay, so this was a very brief kind of uh, introduction. And of course, uh, these days, um, so uh, I will skip the outline to save some time. But so these days, um, HBN uh, emitters have been observed uh, by many groups, which is great. And um, the important part here is that there are many, many systems and many, many different geometries of of HBN materials uh, from many different samples, but the defect structure is still unknown. And I will just go briefly through some of this important work. So uh, the, one of the original works by Lee Bassett, so they showed uh, there is a clear dependency of the polarization with HBN crystallographic access. There were many works that showed that HBN can be tuned all the way from green to the far infrared, but in fact, even from the blue and the UV source of here, this is the only source of single photons uh, works at 4 EV, which is very deep UV. Um, the work from Greg Fuchs by, that showed that the line width can be very, very narrow. And here some uh, means to engineer this defect. So the most recent one um, uh, here by focused ion beam radiation uh, and uh, the work from uh, the Vinod Menon group, which uh, showed that you can create some sort of ensembles and occasionally singles by putting HBN on pillars. Um, and also our work and also work from uh, Tobias Vogel on plasma activated HBN. So, and I apologize if I forgot to mention some of uh, other works on creation and characterization of these emitters, but quite a few uh, systems available. Um, and the defect structure is, is not quite clear yet. So to really pinpoint what the defects are, or at least to understand their properties, we decided that we need to grow our own HBN. Um, and the growth of HBN is quite established. So we follow this, this work here from 2017, which followed an earlier work uh, from 2010. So it's a uh, basically CVD growth where you use some sort of a Borain or a ammonia borane precursor with which is the source of uh, basically boron and nitrogen um, and you put it in the quartz tube then the growth profile here it takes about six hours so basically you can do a few growths uh, during one day uh, and what you get uh, as a result is this very big 
uh, sheet of, of HBN. Uh, it has a very broad Raman, so it's not the best films you can get, but it's, and it's called a crystalline. You can see here different crystallites and the thickness is about uh, 1.5 nanometers. So you grow between three to five monolayers of HBN. So the remarkable property of this material is that most of the emitters here are actually um, for, uh, or centered around the 580, uh, 600 nanometers, which is around the two EV mark. Um, and most of them look exactly like that. So you have a very strong zero phonon line um, and a very weak uh, phonon sideband. Um, and here is an example of just 10 uh, autocorrelation functions that correspond to this red or uh, red dots, red circles. Um, and the green circles um, are basically two emitters, but most of them show exactly this uh, zero phone line. So we can now grow these films uh, reproducibly and repeatedly and uh, produce samples which are millimeter scale. Um, and all also on nickel, copper, or any basically any other material. Um, and you will have about one as single photonometer per micron square, which is great for device applications. And so you can then even kind of tune it a little bit. And instead of growing on pure copper or, or on a film, you can grow on pillars. Um, so this is still unpublished, but uh, uh, so you can grow uh, on this normal silicon oxide pillars. And you will see that every single pillar for a particular size, so this is about 700 nanometer pillars, you will get um, a exactly the same emitter, very strong ZPL with a very weak front and sideband. Um, and you can look at out of 20 pillars, basically most of them would be would have a single photon source. So this is the G2 distribution. So you can see that most of them are actually single emitters. So now we can basically not only localize uh, the emitters specially, uh, spectrally, but also specially. So um, of course, uh, we, when you will remove the flake from the pillars, you would not really know where the site is, but while they're on the pillars, you can really have basically a single photon source uh, in a very specific location. And the, the important bit here is that we're not confined to metal. So this is again, as I mentioned, on silicon oxide actually. Okay, so now uh, that you have access to this uh, single photon sources and very large flakes, you can do quite nice experiments and these are already old results. So I will not go into details. I'll just say that uh, the emitters show very clear behavior of tuning, so and quite large. So stark shift tuning, where the shift is about uh, ten or even more nanometers. Sorry, the x-axis here is a bit uh, cut, but you can see it here. So it goes from about six sixty to about six seventy, and goes back and forth. Um, and also strain tuning, where um, uh, we build this very simple. Uh, I mean, even naive, I would say. Um, strain mechanism. So it's basically a PDMS stem that you strain back and forth. And um, it, you can you can go basically a shift again from about 560 to about 580. So quite a large 12 nanometer shift. Everything is at room temperature. Everything is done on a single emitter uh, and everything is reversible. So of course here in the strain, we don't really know um, how much of the strain from the PDMS is transferred to the HBN. So the five and a half percent here is, is really what we estimate from the uh, PDMS strain, but we don't know how much of it is actually transferred to the HBM. But you can see that the emission is, is like the strain is reversible um, and occurs on, on really large scales. So this basically tells you that you have some very strong dipole moment in the defect um, that uh, we study. So the other important point that um, um, uh, I would like to discuss here is the fact that, uh, okay, so of course, because we have now this very large uh, HBN in a 2D like sheet, we can cap it with graphene. And here the results were a bit more surprising. So typically when you cap stuff with graphene, uh, you have what's called non-radiative energy transfer and the emission is quenched. Now what we discovered in HBN is um, that we quench the emitters, but only above a specific level. So only above 600, you see that this is the capped HBN, um, the emission disappears. So this is statistics from the same flake when it's uncapped, you see it resembles exactly the same growth um, statistics of most of the emitters around 580, but there is a long tail. Um, and here the tail completely disappears. So this is what um, typically is the mechanism where you 
put, for example, um, and V centers on graphene, you have some sort of uh, non radiative energy transfer. And we know that this is um, not the mechanism to explain risk results because it's only a selective, uh, a selective kind of elimination of emitters above a specific energy or below a specific energy. So um, to understand this mechanism a bit better, uh, or what's happening is we functionalize the graphene with NMP molecule, and that's the molecule that is shown here. Um, and what this molecule does is basically it shifts the Fermi level of graphene uh, by about 0.2 EV. And so here is an example of uh, uh, just the graphene capped and then the functionalized graphene, you can see that the emitters are restored. So here is the distribution um, of this uh, functionalized graphene, and you can see that the emission above 600 is actually restored. And so this basically allows you to gain information into what's the ground and the excited state of these emitters, or where is it located within the band gap. So, and um, you basically, based on these experiments, you can estimate that the ground state or uh, the ground state of these emitters is located about 2.1 EV below, um, or 2.4 seven, so two and a half EV below the conduction band of HBN. Um, and you know this because um, this is basically the scenario whereby if you transfer graphene, all the emitters with, high, with lower energy or with higher wavelength would be quenched. And as you functionalize the graphene, you raise the Fermi level. So the energy transfer here, or the charge transfer here cannot occur. And so this emitter is basically revived. So the mechanism here is actually quite interesting. So of course you have the non-radiative transfer, but you also have this charge transfer to graphene. And so uh, this is basically actually the first evidence of any sort of charge transfer from a quantum emitters, from a quantum emitter uh, to graphene. So uh, quite interesting results on its own, but also tells you that the emitters uh, have their ground state somewhere very close to the conduction band of HBN, which should in principle aid the uh, theoreticians to assist us with understanding these defects. Okay, so as we progress with this puzzle, so um, we talked with a lot of uh, theory people and essentially it's a kind of a needle in a haystack problem of what the defects are. Unfortunately, in our case, the needle is not that big and the haystack is not that small. Yeah, so it's an, an opposite effect. And so uh, we know that because the emitters are amenable to very strong strain and field, uh, we should have some sort of a like dipole configuration. So it's an NBVN or CBVN defects. Um, we have blinking in most of the emitters. So it's most likely charge conversion or ionization. So there are two or three charge states for these defects. And of course it's fully polarized. Now, um, a lot of efforts has been done by our group and also by our collaborators and also by uh, other groups on trying to correlate STM with high resolution transmission electron microscope with PLCL. But it's challenging, right? Because um, even though you work with a 2D system, um, it's very hard to pinpoint a single defect. And so here is an example of this group. This work is from uh, the group of Jen Dayon in Stanford. Um, and the work is done by mostly by Faria. And so here, um, you can see that we exfoliate uh, an HBN flake on top of a TEM grid, and you can find a place, a specific place uh, at about five nanometers where you can see cathode luminescence signal, which means that you drive the system with electrons and photoluminescence, which are very similar. But even when you zoom into this region, you can see already that you have about hundreds of defects. Okay, so because initially we thought, well, if you take a very clean HBN sheet and you can see the emission both photoluminescence and cathodoluminescence, you can kind of zoom in and do high resolution TM and find only a single defect, but that is not the case. You can see here there are many, many line defects, point defects uh, in these images, and you cannot correlate directly between this single point defect and the emission because this is still taken from about five nanometers um, area. And as you zoom in, you have about 10 or even more uh, point defects. Now you can also turn your attention to the super resolution work. And this is from the group of Alexander Radinovich. And once again, you can find this beautiful HBN flake and you can perform super resolution, oops, sorry, imaging and find localized spots. And when you take exactly the same flake into your TEM and you zoom in, um, you can see that within again, five, about five nanometers, you have many, many, many defects. So it's very hard to basically correlate with standard techniques, um, standard high resolution and TM techniques between your defect 
um, and your emission profile. So these results are very, very challenging or this, this experiments are very, very challenging. So to tackle this problem, um, we decided to try and pinpoint the defect by modifying the growth conditions. And um, here we decided to tackle the carbon defect straight away. The reason why we decided to tackle the carbon defect straight away is because there was a lot of literature, including very recent uh, theory and experimental work here by the group of Padres of Skaskas, um, that described that basically carbon is the proposed as the origin of the UV emission in NHP. And um, of course, we're not looking at the UV, but that's a good starting point to basically look into carbon. And so what we did with our collaborators in ANU um, is in Australian National University, um, we grow HBN sample by what's called molecular uh, organic vapor phase epitaxy. And you can, as we, and, and we perform control samples where we increase deterministically the carbon influx, which means that we increase the carbon concentration in the films and we compare it to other means of growing HBN, for example, by MBE. And what we saw is that every time when we have a carbon in the source of the growth, we would obtain single emitters, okay? And even when we perform conversion from HOPG to HBN, which is an established process, you still observe some sort of uh, single emitters in HBN. So this is the table that summarizes the results. Most of the reference here is basically to undoped growth on sapphire and versus carbon doped growth on sapphire, which shows the meters when you add the carbon. So here are the results from the MOVP. You can see that when we uh, go from TEB60, which is um, basically about 2% carbon, which is huge, you don't get, of course, any single emitters, but you get this very clear signature of uh, basically emission at around 580 with a phonon sideband. And as you decrease your carbon concentration to about less than half percent, in a normal uh, optical measurement, you do not detect basically any emission. And that's at where you start to do confocal microscope. And so if you kind of perform confocal microscope on this TB10 sample, which is less than half percent carbon, you can definitely find isolated single emitters with line shape and profile corresponding directly to the ensemble. And this is very interesting. That's really the first time where you can kind of scale back or scale down or scale up your carbon concentration and go from singles to ensembles. Um, the other important bit here is that you can do um, some sort of basic chemical analysis. And as you increase the TB flow, you can increase the NC and the BC um, bonding. Now, this doesn't tell you directly that you have correlation with your single emitters in carbon, but it definitely tells you that you create more carbon defects. And of course, if you create more carbon defects and you have this line shape profiles, which are similar to um, exactly the single profile, it looks like uh, carbon related emission. So we continue to this. So this is the results from the MBE uh, process. Again, that's what you get from HBN, which is only grown on sapphire without any carbon, just a chromium line um, and the Raman. And when you add a bit of carbon, you can see again, this very similar profile of emitters. Um, and the kind of smoking gun for this for this experiment is down implantation. Um, so here, the, this slide is a bit busy. So, but you can kind of um, mask part of your uh, HBN film and implant, and you can see that pre-annealing um, with carbon implantation, you form a very similar defect. There is not much phonon cyban here, uh, and they're very quite rare. And when you anneal the sample, you will see again um, exactly this same similar line shape profile. Um, this was done with high dose, so hence you don't see any G2. So this is just to show you that we create ensembles. Um, but the important bit here is that when you implant oxygen and silicon, you do not see uh, any of the narrow lines here. So in unanneal samples, you see only this boron vacancy. I will talk about it towards the end of my talk. Um, and with uh, after annealing, you only see broad emission, which has nothing to do with this ZPL phone outside. So you can also um, take white field imaging and this shows the results quite clearly. So for example, here in MOVP samples, which are again, these are the carbon uh, doped sample. You can see, of course, even without implantation, you can see this uh, very localized spot. This is the TEB10, uh, which means that we expect some localized emitters. And then you, as you increase your carbon implantation, you basically get ensembles. Um, and this is implantation into exfoliated HBN, which is very pure HBN. 
Um, and you can see that as you increase your implantation dose, you can create more and more localized spots which correlate to those single emitters. And of course, you do not see the same experiments when you implant oxygen or silica. So in a, in a way, um, if it walks and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. And, and although it doesn't sound very scientific at this point, this is the best evidence we have to basically correlate with carbon uh, defects in HBN. Um, and so now we um, spend some time talking to and discussing these results with uh, theorists, with DFT people. And um, so our own calculation showed um, that the probability of VNCB, which means that you have a carbon ion sitting on the boron side nearby a vacancy sitting on the nitrogen side is very promising candidate. Um, it basically has a dipole moment um, and it creates this ball out of plane deformation and they are predicted to have to be very sensitive to both uh, strain and electric fields. So that's basically in line with all the tuning that we measured and measured by other groups. Um, and most of the other carbon-based configurations are basically um, eliminated due to long lifetimes and, and also broad emissions. So this is one configuration. Um, another configuration was recently proposed by uh, Jara and colleagues. There is an archive here. And their result actually matches uh, the ZPL and the phonon sideband with a remarkable precision. When, when this result came out, we were very, very happy. So, and they claim that um, these defects are actually carbon clusters. So it's a C2CB and C2CN, which means that you have uh, basically an array of three carbon atoms um, in the lattice of HBN. Now, these results are actually interesting because this can explain why our formation probabilities are very, very low. So if you look at this implantation results, you can see that you need to implant about 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13 carbons to get kind of very nice dense um, monolayer, the very nice dense layer of emitters. And if you compare these results to, for example, diamond, in diamond, you only need to implant 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11 to get um, quite reproducibly single photon sources. So we are about the formation energies, or I should say the formation probability is very, very low. Um, and so this can explain why, because if you need to create three carbons uh, atom nearby, um, that does take um, some low probability. So um, we're still kind of um, under uh, ex kind of investigation with what the actual origin is, but we are very confident now that these are carbon related defects. And I showed you here with the, some help of some theoreticians that these are the, uh, Kind of front runners in terms of what the defects are. Okay, so I will talk a little bit about spin properties. Um, and again, um, I think most of the community that works on single defects in, in solids are interested in spins in one way or another. So here the initial pioneering work was actually done by Lee Bassett that observed that for some emitters you have magnetic field dependence as you swipe your um, as you swipe your kind of your magnet. Um, there was no OD ODMR, which is the optically detected magnetic resonance at the beginning of this work. Um, and in parallel, we also did some neutron radiation. And actually neutron radiation, you get this beautiful pink HBN crystal. So it look like a pink diamond, but it's not, it's pink HBN. And the photo is real, it's not a uh, false color. And here you do observe at around 800 nanometers, this broad emission. Ignore these peaks, these are artifacts from our spectrometer. So the emission is just broad um, and it's not singles yet, okay? So it's just new emission, but not singles. Um, but remarkably for this uh, type of emitters, you can actually detect, uh, optically detect, you can actually detect an ODMR signal. So this is a zero field, it's about 3.5, 3.6 gigahertz. Uh, ground state splitting. And of course, as you apply magnetic field, it uh, splits apart. Um, and uh, you have a triplet ground state, and this is an ensemble of boron vacancies. So it's a different defect. It meets at this 850 nanometers, very broad, um, and it's a spin one system. So you can also do uh, EPR on this. Um, so this is a very basic level diagram. You have MS equals zero and MS plus minus one. Um, it's a A1 and B1 states. Um, and as you apply uh, basically a magnetic field, you can access these two, uh, these two sub levels um, and get the zero field splitting and then the high and low. And so under high magnetic field, you can see that um, 
the BZH, which is this line, is basically much bigger than the BZL line, which indicates that you have a D bigger than zero. So um, there is a lot of information in this slide, but for time constraints, I'll just be very quick. But this was done to basically understand if the sign is positive or negative, because in, even if you see um, ODMR at zero magnetic field, you still don't know if these sub levels are above or below the MS equals zero. So we know that they're above um, because of this experiment. So if it was below, then this peak would have been smaller than this one. So it's a, a you need a high uh, magnetic field APR. So uh, as I mentioned, so MS equals zero and uh, plus minus one, um, and uh, it's the negatively charged boron vacancy, and you can then do a very high a resolution hyperfine splitting and um, for instance to eliminate the bore, the nitrogen vacancy so here um, you can see that um, it doesn't really match with all your uh, nuclear spins and here it matches quite nicely so you have basically uh, about seven peaks so um, matches seven lines so here you should have much more about 19 so it's a negatively charged boron vacancy. Uh, we are very confident uh, in this result. Uh, and this was done in collaboration with Vladimir Dyakonov, actually in his lab um, in Woodbrook by um, Andy Gottschall. And so then, of course, you can do some even basic Rabi um, uh, oscillations. And uh, this is to be published very soon. And also, um, recently, we did some sort of temperature dependent and, and lattice dependent of this um, um, defect. So it can be also used as a sensor. And of course, now where you have a 2D layer, um, sensing is actually becoming quite interesting because you can put those in a very close proximity to whatever you want to sense. So the coherence times are not great. Um, a few microseconds only, um, but that's something that one can work on. Of course, you are here limited pretty much by the boron and the nitrogen uh, nuclear spins, which is your lattice, which is unlike diamond, it can be pure carbon-12, which is a nuclear spin zero. Uh, here, you don't have this, this privilege, so one need to go and of go around it and find ways to uh, optimize or increase the spin coherence if, if needed. Um, and if now there are also other works. This is from the group of Go. Um, they're on archive, not published yet, but uh, just for information, um, these works uh, also just appeared uh, very recently, I think last month. Okay, so I think I still have about um, five minutes, but I, I'm also the last speaker, so I think uh, I can uh, take my time. So we can also now basically engineer these defects on demand. So because it's a basically a simple boron vacancy, uh, which means just a missing boron, you can basically bombard the HBN with any source. So uh, we tried nitrogen, argon, and xenon. Of course, nitrogen works best because when xenon is a big atom incoming into HBN, um, you create a lot of holes, a lot of defects straight away. So not only a single uh, atom knockoff or knock on. So here you can create basically an array of these defects. Um, and they all show this same emission and also optical detective magnetic resonance. So um, we are now confident that we can also create these defects uh, basically on demand. All right. So to basically wrap it up and to show you, um, because it's a, after all, integrated photonics uh, or quantum photonics session, we also now started to play around with hybridizing this HBN um, materials with cavities. So uh, we're not the first, of course, to do this. Uh, there are plenty of works by other groups um, that uh, positions already 2D materials on top of waveguides and, and quantum dots on top of integrated circuits. There are some examples here. Um, but of course, um, it's the way to go with the systems where you want to integrate your source, which is the best source with the best waveguide or cavity. And so that's exactly what we did. And uh, as I mentioned, we can uh, grow HBN now on, on, on different substrates. So we could grow um, HBN and then move it onto silicon nitride and then fabricate the cavity straight away. Um, and we chose silicon nitride because it's transparent in this range and you can create very high Q um, optical cavities from silicon nitride. So here you can see the cavity uh, that we made. It's a 1D photonic cavity with some tapered region from silicon nitride. But the remarkable part here is that you cannot see here is that HBN is already on top. So here, that's an optical image. So you can see that here, this region has no HBN. 
In this region, we already transferred the HBN on top. So you can see this dotted line. Um, and the quality factors of both regions are almost exactly the same. So there are example of five here, but that's a full histogram. It's about two to 3,000 quality factor in the visible. That is what we expect from this type of, of cavities. And you can see that the HBN does not actually degrade um, the cavity Q at all. And it's a very thin layer, about a few nanometers um, that we transfer. And we can fabricate the cavities um, straight away with the HBN, which means that um, you don't need to do any alignment uh, later on. Um, and because of the high density of emitters, most of them will actually sit, um, or at least one of them per cavity will sit in that hot spot of hotspot. And so here is one example. Um, so that's a Q of about 2400. You can see that the enhancement here is quite strong. Um, the G2 is quite good. Um, it's very noisy here because the HBN blinks a lot. So we were afraid that it will die. And indeed, most of them actually blink and, and die. That's a problem that we are now trying to address. Um, but we can measure per cell factor of about 20, and we can also tune it um, mostly randomly at this point because they bleach and blink. But you can see that uh, here is an example of a found emitter, which is very weak. And then it's coupled to the cavity and uncoupled again. And then after some time, it will bleach and, and disappear. So um, basically, we can kind of couple the emitters to cavities. Uh, at this point, not so much deterministically because the blinking is a big problem. Um, and we're trying to address it now. Okay, so I think I will leave some time for questions then. And uh, I showed you that we can engineer and control um, these uh, single photonometers pretty much on demand these days. Um, we have record tuning. I didn't discuss much in details, but uh, we can tune the emitters by both electrically and strain. Um, cavity engineering, I showed you mostly the hybrid. We can also make cavities from HBN, but so far there is not much advantage over those. Um, and the fact that we found uh, new spin defects, uh, but we need to make sure that we identify them as single. There are not singles yet, mostly on ensemble, but I hope in two years time, uh, we can move towards single systems. So um, just acknowledging the group, uh, typically we have an annual barbecue, but due to COVID, um, everything was basically closed. This is from last month. So um, Noah, that was done most of the growth, he's actually graduated. So he's moving towards his uh, postdoctoral fellowship. Um, Han, uh, who also participated, she also now in ETH as a postdoc. So Jong actually started her own group in Melbourne. So um, a lot of changes within the group in the last few, few months. And I would just thank you for your attention um, and uh, welcome you all to visit Sydney once the borders are open again and say that we have uh, many PhDs and postdocs and visiting fellowships available as part of this Center for Transformative Meta-Optical System that uh, I'm part of. So thank you very much. Thank you, Igor, for sharing such a very detailed study on these uh, defects in HBN. Um, let me start with the first question. Um, you, uh, towards the end of your talk, you, you basically, um, you know, you, you, you put um, an HBN on top of a photonic crystal um, kind of uh, cavity or waveguide. And this was silicon, no? Silicon or silicon nitride? Yeah, this was silicon nitride. So, so uh, you also did some work previously on, on, on making photonic crystal uh, waveguides and cavities out of HBN. So I ask myself, why don't you use an all HBN platform? Yeah, so um, you can. So you can use an all HBN platform. Let me see if I have a slide. Um, the fabrication of silicon nitride is a bit easier. So it's really mostly about the fabrication probability, basically how many devices working after one um, um, after one session. Um, let me see if I can uh, find something. I don't have the bulk. Hmm. Don't have the bulk here. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, let me share the screen again. Um, yeah, so it's basically mostly about fabrication. It's much easier to fabricate from uh, silicon nitride than from uh, bulk HBN, um, and that's why we tried the silicon nitride as well. Also, in terms of emitter creation, so when we transfer this film onto the silicon nitride, we know that the emitter density is very, very high. 
uh, when we make the cavities from HBN, from bulk HBN, we need them to induce emittance by ion implantation, which doesn't give you this very high uh, density just yet. So um, it's a combination of these two factors. Mm -hmm. And then what kind of Q factors you usually reach if you, if you do it, um, you know, these photonic crystal cavities out of HBN? So out of HBN, we can get to about 2000 at best. Okay. At the visible, re repeatedly two, yeah, one and a half to two. It should be enough to demonstrate very simple per cell, not enough to do anything kind of serious in terms of strong coupling or anything like that. Okay, thank you. So there are uh, questions from the audience here uh, from Moritz Fischer. He says, thank you for a very nice talk. What do you think is the influence of the HBN crystal quality on the single photon emitters, for instance, for annealing or exfoliated HBN flakes? So it's a bit, um, so basically if you start with very pure HBN, um, um, the very pure that you can get from, uh, I think the world famous uh, Professor Watanabe and Professor Taniguchi in NIMS. In, in NIM. So if you can, if you anneal them, you basically get no emitters at all. Um, if you start with material that is less pure, like the commercial flakes or even their own less clean material, then after annealing, you would have a lot of emitters. And this is because carbon um, is actually quite a common impurity in HBN, so it's very hard to eliminate. Um, so it's very analogous to what happens in diamond. If you take a um, normal type to ACVD and you anneal, you will have a lot of NVs. You can also find some silicon vacancies naturally, but if you take an electronic gray diamond and you anneal, then there is almost no emitters. So there is a direct correlation. So you need, it depends what your final goal is, um, but there is a direct correlation between the crystal purity and the single photon emitters that you can find. Okay, thanks. And then there's a second question by Pablo Postigo. Impressive work, Igor, congrats. Can the HBN be electrically contacted for electrical pumping? How difficult is that concerning st the stability of HBN? So, um, okay, that's uh, so we were trying to do electrical excitation of HBN defects for many, many, many years. Um, we haven't succeeded. I think, uh, Lucas, you have a work on. Uh, HBN charge injection, right? If I remember correctly, between kind of gold plates uh, from few yeah, years Yeah, but ago. this is tunneling, so we don't yeah. inject into any defect states. Yeah, so uh, exactly. So I guess uh, we didn't many we didn't manage to inject anything into any defects. We didn't manage to see any electroluminescence, uh, and we tried with very thin devices that have clear. Uh, photoluminescent single from single defects, but when you do, um, when you put contacts or graphene or any other metals, uh, it doesn't really work. Uh, of course, the challenge is that you cannot make a really PIN junction or PIN device because there is no real N-type uh, HBN. And when you go hybrid with external P and external N, you don't really know where your uh, alignment of your levels are. Um, so, so far it doesn't really work. Uh, and stability. I mean, if you work below the band breakdown voltage, you should be okay. But then, of course, you get tunneling if you go above it or you're just breaking the HBN. So basically, it doesn't work for now. I would, but I hope that somebody will show it one day. Okay. So thanks. So with this, I would like to close this session. Thank you, Igor. The nice thing is you have a day ahead of you, while the most of us have to go to bed right now. Okay, so um, yes, to everybody, um, have a good evening or wherever you are, a good day. And uh, we reconvene tomorrow at three o'clock. Um, see you then. Bye bye.